2020 related to domestic violence extremism, the last of which was issued on December 30th without any mention of the joint session of Congress or the Capitol, unquote. We need an explanation for that silence, Director Ray, because in the lead up to the attack, in report after report, your field agents tried to sound the alarm. To be clear, Director Ray, I know that you take the attack on the Capitol as seriously as anybody, and that under your direction, the FBI is engaged in a massive undertaking to bring the perpetrators of the attack to justice. But the FBI's inaction in the weeks leading up to the January 6th is simply baffling. It's hard to tell whether FBI headquarters merely missed the evidence, which had been flagged by your field offices and was available online for all the world to see, or whether the Bureau saw the intelligence, underestimated the threat, and simply failed to act. Neither is acceptable. We need your help to get to the bottom of it. We also need your help to get at the root causes of the attack, the extremism and racism that to be sure has been with the nation since before its founding, but that former President Trump and others have encouraged and would exploit for political gain. This is, a, this is not a rhetorical problem. The threat of white nationalism and far-right extremism is very real. Studies show a surge of hate crimes plagues our country right now. I know you to be a man of good conscience and that you condemn these acts of hatred in the strongest possible terms. But the time has come to put the resources of the Bureau where they belong. A recent study found that, quote, white supremacists and other like-minded extremists conducted two-thirds of the terrorist plots and attacks in the United States in 2020, unquote. And the time has come for the FBI to confront this threat directly. For too long, the FBI has downplayed the threat of white nationalism, focusing instead on far more distant threats and occasionally on imaginary threats like black identity extremism. And although the FBI no longer uses that particular term, I'm just as disturbed by the Bureau's current practice, practice of lumping together a wide range of activities under the term racially motivated violent extremism, as if there were any equivalence whatsoever between black and brown activists marching for justice and the right-wing extremists who attacked the Capitol Police and tried to hang Mike Pence. The FBI must prioritize this threat. The Bureau cannot be afraid to call these groups by their names. The Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, neo-Nazis, and other similar organizations pose an immediate threat to my colleagues, my constituents, and my family. And the FBI must also do the hard work of keeping itself honest. Ample evidence shows that the crowd that stormed the Capitol was full of off-duty police and military personnel. Accordingly, it is past time for the FBI to begin what the Department of Homeland Security and the Pentagon have already begun, a full internal review of white supremacist membership within the Bureau. I do not mean to downplay your service to the country during the chaotic last few years. These have been trying times, and I can only imagine what it must be like to do your job in the shadow of a president who reportedly threatened to fire you for your refusing to launch baseless investigations of his political opponents. In particular, I want to commend the Bureau for its work on the security of our election systems. The FBI is charged with preventing both mechanical meddling and disinformation campaigns. Your work to secure the 2020 election led to one of the most secure elections in our lifetime, and we owe you a debt of gratitude for that. I look forward to hearing more from you on how the Bureau will continue to secure voting systems and to safeguard the right to vote next November. That work is critical because at base, Trust in our democracy is what keeps our country vibrant and strong. Faith in our democratic institutions binds diverse people with different values and different backgrounds together in common cause. In the wake of the insurrection, nothing could be more important in your, in your work or mine than rebuilding that trust. Thank you again for being here today. I look forward to your testimony. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, thank you for being here. Over the past several years, Americans have seen their liberties attacked. Every right, every right we enjoy under the First Amendment has been assaulted. Every single one. Your right to worship, your right to assemble, your right to petition, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, every single one. There are places today where a full congregation can still not meet on a Sunday morning. Your right to assemble. Four weeks ago, I spoke to the New Mexico Republican Party in Amarillo, Texas. They had to go to Texas for freedom because they weren't allowed to assemble in their own state. Your right to petition your government, 
we said here today on Capitol Hill having an important hearing with the director of the FBI, but our constituents can't come to their Capitol, lobby their member of Congress to redress their grievances because the Speaker of the House won't let them in. Freedom of the press, maybe the best example is the President won't go to the border, the Vice President won't go to the border. When Secretary Mayorkas went to the border, he wouldn't let the press in the very facilities he was touring. And of course, freedom of speech, we all know what's happened to that. Big tech, censoring conservatives, the cancel culture mob attacking anyone who disagrees with them, deplatforming the sitting president of the United States, Democrats writing letters to the network carriers telling them to take certain news organizations off their network, off their, uh, not off their platform. Freedom is under attack, and Director, a lot of Americans think you're part of the problem. Before you got there, the Comey FBI spied on the Trump campaign. Over the last three years, the FBI labeled the baseball field shooting where our friend and colleague Steve Scalise was shot, labeled that suicide by cop for three years. We know the guy set out to go after Republicans. He had a piece of paper in his pocket with six Republican names on it. Somehow the FBI thought it was suicide by cop. Thank goodness you've changed that. More recently, the FBI raided the New York apartment of Mayor Giuliani. The president's personal lawyer, former U.S. attorney, ran the Southern District of New York office. According to press accounts, he said he was willing to give whatever information you all wanted, whatever the Justice Department wanted, but no, you kicked in his door instead. How about the couple in Alaska? Paul and Marilyn Huber. They sure witnessed an attack on their liberty in an up-close and personal way. The FBI kicked in their door, handcuffed them, held them at gunpoint, interrogated them for four hours in their own home. There was just one problem. They had the wrong people. Had the wrong people. Took their phones, took their laptop, took a pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. There's got to be some irony in that. And then there's FISA. 2018, FISA Court Judge, uh, Judge Boasberg said there were major privacy violations by the FBI. 2019, Inspector General Horowitz did uh, two, uh, two investigations. First one was on the Carter Page FISA application. He found 17 errors in that, when 51 wrong or unsupported statements in that FISA application. 17 errors, 51 wrong statements. That's a nice way of saying 68 lies that were taken to the FISA court. Mr. Horowitz then looked at 25 randomly sampled uh, FISA application, specifically the Woods file, the underlying documents that supports what's taken to the court, in every single one he said there was a problem. Every, all 25. In four of them he couldn't even find the Woods file. But the last time the director was in front of us, February of last year, you told us everything was fine. You said this, quote, Americans should not lose sleep over the FISA application process. But just two months ago, Judge Boasberg was back with another report and he said there are, quote, apparent widespread violations by the FBI of the standards they have in place to deal with Section 702 of FISA. Which raises a sort of fundamental question. Why are you using the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Act to spy on Americans, Director? I appreciate the tough job you have and, and the, the good work the good work that the vast majority of your agents, I think, do, but freedom-loving Americans have concerns about their liberty, but I think they also have concerns about the opportunity cost. When you're kicking in the door of the president's lawyer, when you're interrogating innocent couple for four hours, when you're spying on Americans, then by definition, that means there are fewer resources going to stop terrorists at our southern border, stopping cyber attacks, prosecuting Antifa, terrorists, and other rioters who attack law enforcement, small businesses, the Capitol and did over a billion dollars of damage over the last year. And frankly, that there also means there's fewer resources to figure out where this virus started. So I, we're going to have some tough questions for you, Director. We appreciate you being here, and we trust that you're going to answer our questions. You're going to answer them directly. Because again, when you think about what Americans have had to live through, the rights that they have that have been infringed as, as, as citizens of this great country, it's a serious time, and so we hope you'll answer the tough questions that will come from the Republican side. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. I will now introduce today's witness. Christopher Wray became the eighth director of the FBI on August 2nd, 2017. 
Director Ray began his law enforcement career in 1997, serving in the Department of Justice as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Northern District of, of uh, Georgia. In 2001, he was named Associate Deputy Attorney General and then Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General in the Office of the Deputy Attorney General in Washington, D.C. Mr. Ray was nominated by President George Bush in 2003 to be the Assistant T Attorney General for DOJ's Criminal Division, which included the Counterterrorism Section and the Counterintelligence and Export Control Section at the time. In addition to his extensive time in public service, Mr. Ray has spent a total of almost 17 years practicing law in the international law firm of King Sp and Spaulding LLP, working in the area of government investigations and white collar crime. At the time of his nomination to be FBI director, Mr. Ray was chair of the firm's Special Matters and Government Investigations Practice Group. He graduated with a bachelor's degree from Yale University in 1989 and earned his law degree from Yale Law School in 1992. He also clerked for Judge Michael, J. Michael Luddig of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. We welcome Director Ray. We thank him for participating today. Now, if you please rise, I'll begin by swearing you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and beliefs to help you God? Let the record show that the witness has answered in the affirmative. Thank you, and please be seated. Please note that your written test statement will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there is a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. Director Ray, you may begin. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to talk about the FBI's enduring efforts to keep the American people safe. As you know, over our almost 113-year history, the FBI has worked tirelessly alongside our trusted partners to confront a host of threats facing our country, from the persistent threat posed by terrorists, both foreign and domestic, to the counterintelligence threat posed by the government's of aggressive adversaries like China and Russia, to the scourge of violence threatening our neighborhoods, to the rising and evolving threat posed by cyber criminals who seek to hold hostage our companies and our critical infrastructure. I suspect we'll be covering these and other topics today, but I'd like to start by discussing an issue that is of utmost concern to me, to you, and to all Americans, which is the prevalence of violence in our country. Over the last few years, we've witnessed the troubling phenomenon of people resorting to violence and destruction of property to further their ideological, political, or social goals. Far too often, far too often, we're seeing individuals inspired by one or more extremist ideologies to commit criminal acts against their fellow Americans. Now, the FBI does not and should not police ideology and we do not investigate groups or individuals based on the exercise of First Amendment protected activity alone. But when we encounter violence and threats to public safety, the FBI will not hesitate to take appropriate action. That is not a controversial issue that should force anyone to take sides. We can all agree that violence in any form in support of any set of beliefs cannot and will not be tolerated because violence undermines one of the most basic freedoms of all Americans, the right to feel safe and secure in our own homes and communities. We saw this kind of extremist violence on January 6th when an angry mob used violence and the destruction of property to break into the U.S. Capitol in a failed attempt to undermine our institutions of government and our democratic process. An assault where you, the members of Congress, were victims, but where all Americans were victimized and more than 100 law enforcement officers were injured in just a few hours. Through the dogged work of FBI agents, analysts, and professionals working alongside federal, state, and local partners, we've been able to make close to 500 arrests so far, with more sure to come. 
We also saw extremist violence during last summer's civil unrest. And although most citizens made their voices heard through peaceful, lawful protests, others, far too many, persistently exploited those protests to pursue violent extremist agendas. In Portland alone, hundreds of law enforcement officers sustained injuries and damage to federal buildings was estimated in the millions of dollars. Across the country, federal, state, and local authorities arrested thousands of individuals who committed criminal acts surrounding those protests. And nearly every one of the FBI's 56 field offices opened investigations amounting to hundreds of investigations involving violent and destructive conduct. More recently, we've seen an alarming increase in hate crimes across the country, many targeting members of the Asian American Pacific Islander and Jewish communities. In some cases, these crimes are carried out by individuals we characterize as racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists. To confront this threat, we've taken a multi-pronged approach focusing on our traditional investigative efforts through our civil rights program and our domestic terrorism hate crimes fusion cell that we created about a year and a half ago, but also enhancing our law enforcement training, public outreach, and support to our state and local partners. Our efforts to stem extremist violence are on top of our continued and extensive work to disrupt violent gangs, drug organizations, and human traffickers whose criminal acts devastate families and communities. For many of you, violent crime remains the most significant and most pernicious threat you face in your home district. And in difficult times like these, we must never forget the extraordinary bravery of our federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement members who risk life and safety every single day to protect the public and keep the peace. And I say that because over the past year, we've seen a troubling uptick in violence against members of the law enforcement community. In just the first five months of 2021, 36 officers have been feloniously killed on the job. That's far surpassing the number by this time last year. To put that in perspective, that's almost two law enforcement officers shot and killed every week. And that's not counting all those officers who've died in the line of duty facing the countless other inherent dangers of the job, like racing in pursuit of a suspect and dying in a car accident or drowning in an attempted rescue or even the scores of officers who've died from COVID-19 because law enforcement, of course, kept coming to work every day, right through the teeth of the pandemic. Nor is it counting all those officers who've been badly injured, but thankfully survived, but whose lives and whose families' lives have been forever changed. Now, the loss of any agent or officer is heartbreaking for their families, for their departments, for their communities that they serve, we in the FBI know that all too well with the terrible, terrible loss of Special Agents Laura Schwarzenberger and Dan Alfin this past February, shot and killed down near Miami. Each one of the officers and agents we've lost this year were people who got up one morning, picked up their badge, not knowing whether they'd make it home that night. And they did their jobs despite all the hardships they faced in this almost epically difficult year because they were devoted to protecting their fellow Americans, both friends and strangers alike. And we owe these dedicated public servants a debt of gratitude. More than that, we owe them our best efforts to help stem the tide of violence. All of us here today have a shared responsibility to take a stand, to protect our communities, to support those who serve in law enforcement, and to condemn violence regardless of its motivation. And we in the FBI are ready to do that exactly, to use all the tools at our disposal to uphold the rule of law and to fulfill our mission to protect every American because there is simply no place in this country for hatred, intolerance, or violence regardless of its motivation, ideology, or otherwise. So thank you for taking the time to hear from me today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. I will recognize myself for five minutes. 
According to documents we've received from the Bureau, the FBI was aware that several violent extremists already under investigation were preparing to travel to Washington in January. In December, FBI Atlanta issued an alert that certain militia groups were preparing for a significant event in January, perhaps on Inauguration Day. And on January 5th, a report from FBI Norfolk warned about specific calls for violence at the Capitol the next day, some of them graphic. Congress needs to hear of glass breaking, doors being kicked in, and blood being spilled. The report also noted that individuals were sharing maps of the tunnels underneath the Capitol complex and listed rally points where the attackers would gather before advancing on the building. We know that the Norfolk report made it to the FBI's Washington field office in advance of the attack. And yet, for days after the attack, the head of that field office insisted that it, had, that it had received no intelligence suggesting anything other than First Amendment activity. Director A, the warnings coming in from around the country were clear. Here in Washington, the, did the FBI simply miss the evidence, or did it see the evidence and fail to piece it together? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, as you could imagine, we are just as outraged by what happened on January 6th and just as determined to do our part to make sure that never happens again. Now, the Norfolk report that you referenced uh, was a specific piece of raw, unverified intelligence that emerged on January 5th, the day before, from a source online, unvetted, uh, and despite the raw nature of it, it was quickly passed not one, not two, but three different ways to the Capitol Police. One, an email to uh, their representatives on our Joint Terrorism Task Force. Uh, two, in a verbal briefing in our command post that included members of the Capitol Police, MPD, et cetera. And third, uh, in our law enforcement portal, which all law enforcement uh, partners have access to. Uh, so we tried to uh, make sure that we got that information to the right people. Obviously, any time there is an attack, especially one as significant as this one, uh, you can be darn sure that we are going to be looking hard at how we can do better, how we can do more, how we can do things differently in terms of collecting, analyzing, and disseminating intelligence. Now, you also mentioned uh, individuals under investigation uh, before January 6th. A couple things on that. First, uh, the FBI did disseminate, uh, I think, about a dozen intelligence products, including warning of domestic violent extremism related to the election, some talking about it continuing past the election all the way through inauguration, uh, including reports together with DHS put out in December uh, the month before. As far as individuals actually under investigation, now that we're close to 500 arrests into the matter, um, you may be surprised to, to learn that, in fact, almost none of the individuals charged and found to be involved with uh, the attack on the Capitol were, in fact, individuals who were previously present. Okay, at, 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 at 12.53 p.m. on January 6th, rioters broke through the outer barricades surrounding the lawn of the Capitol. Shortly after 1.45, the rioters surged past the Capitol Police protecting the Capitol's west steps, and at 1.49, Officers officially declared there was a riot at the Capitol. Acting Attorney General Rosen testified before the Oversight Committee that he learned that the FBI and the ATF received requests for assistance from the Capitol Police and were be beginning to respond. When specifically in that timeline of events did Capitol Police request assistance from the FBI, and how quickly was that help deployed? Uh, I don't have the specific time for you, so I, I don't want to misspeak. Okay. Um, okay. The FBI's Washington field office is one of the largest field offices in the country. The field office was reportedly found, found in, by an internal review in 2019 to be both ineffective and inefficient. Specifically, the review criticized the field office's mechanisms for collecting and analyzing threat intelligence, as well as its procedures for sharing intelligence with other law enforcement agencies, including the Capitol Police. Did the Washington field office's uh, domestic terrorism shortcomings lead to a delayed response in the lead up to and on January 6th? Uh, my recollection of that particular audit or, or inspection um, is that it was a while back and that we had recently changed the leadership of the Washington Field Office and made a number of reforms. So to my knowledge, at least, none of the issues that were discussed in that earlier report contributed to the response on January 6th. Thank you. My time is short, but I want to get in one last question. 
In February, the Secretary of Defense converted senior military officials and civilian leadership of the armed forces to assess the problem of, of extremist ideology in the military's ranks. In late April, the Department of Homeland Security announced it was conducting an internal review to root out white supremacy and other extremist ideology in its ranks. There can be no question that law enforcement agencies across the country face a similar challenge. Is the FBI conducting its own internal inspection or review to root out white supremacy and other extremist ideology? And if not, will you commit to conducting such a review? Well, Mr. Chairman, obviously we take the, the prospect of what uh, the intelligence community or law enforcement would refer to as an insider threat uh, very seriously. We have a whole slew of procedures and internal reviews that speak to that, uh, and I'd be happy to see if we can provide you more information on that uh, separately. Thank you very much. My time has expired, and I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Chairman, Mr. McClintock will go first for our side. Mr. McClintock. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, uh, last month, 180,000 foreign nationals illegally crossed our border. That's a 674 percent increase over last May, nearly a million so far this year. The leaders of Mexico and the Northern Triangle countries all say this is in direct response to the Biden open border policies. I don't think there's any question that's the case. Uh, these policies have produced the largest human trafficking operation since the international slave trade. Can you tell us how many persons on the terrorist watch list have been encountered this year crossing through our southern border? Uh, Congressman, I'm not sure that I have that number, but it may be that we can provide the specifics uh, separately. I do know that our uh, field offices down on the border uh, work very closely with CBP, especially focused on so-called special interest aliens as well as potential. Yeah, but I, I, I've watched I just don't have the numbers groups being here. flagged through straight to transportation uh, uh, hubs. How many persons with criminal records or criminal warrants have been encountered this year crossing our southern border? Again, I don't, I don't have the specific figures, uh, but I know that our field offices down there, both of, all of which I've visited, work can, very closely with you on this issue, and I agree with you that it's a significant security concern. Well, uh, would you think it's a more dangerous threat to our nation's security than, say, whether uh, Rudy Giuliani filed the right paperwork for his lobbying firm? <laughs> uh, I really can't discuss any specific individuals' can you at least give us the FBI estimate of how many terrorists, criminals, and gang members are among the hundreds of thousands of gotaways that the Border Patrol has been unable to intercept? Again, I'd be happy to see if I can provide specific numbers and information to be helpful to your request uh, separately. So I'm happy to follow up with your staff on well, that. On that point, uh, House Republican Leader Kevin McCarthy sent you a letter in April uh, requesting a briefing on this subject. Uh, will you commit to keeping Mr. McCarthy, in fact, all members of, of this committee fully informed of it. Uh, I believe we have actually may have already even provided the, uh, the briefing that you're referring to for Leader McCarthy. And will you provide that for all members of this committee? Again, I'm happy to see what information we can provide to be helpful. Well, I hope you could provide me all the information. Again, I have to see what information we can provide, but yes. Is it true that uh, many of the foreign nationals who are being trafficked across our border often arrive here deeply indebted to the Mexican crime cartels? Certainly, we have seen uh, quite a number of such instances, absolutely. Are those debts collected through indentured servitude to the cartels? In some cases, definitely. Um, you know, we. We are pursuing, we have a number of human trafficking task forces, uh, as well as working on certain task forces with DHS to try to address that issue. Uh, but uh, there's no question that the cartel activity on the other side of the border uh, is spilling over in all sorts of ways, and you just put your finger directly on one that is extremely concerning to us all. So we basically, 170 plus years after the 13th Amendment, have slavery burgeoning in this country as a result of these policies. Well, certainly, I, I do consider human trafficking a form of, and I'd like to word, a, modern, a modern form of slavery. I mean, it's Indentured almost medieval. Indentured servitude certainly is. How is yeah. that, you, you, you mentioned uh, out of the country, but how, in this country, how is that enforced? Do the cartels have uh, gang affiliates uh, uh, who uh, extract these, uh, these debts? Well, it, it varies from case to case. Uh, certainly, the cartels have, in different cartels have affiliations with different sorts of gangs here in the United States. 
um, there's not just human trafficking from a labor perspective, so, and so this is, this but is, also this sex is a massive uh, organized crime syndicate burgeoning in this country because of these policies. What are you doing about it? So we, we are attacking, we're, it's a team effort, right? Obviously, DHS has, a, has the primary responsibility for the border itself, uh, but we have Safe Streets Task Forces that go after the gang activity. We have um, OSADEF strike forces that go after the How many agents and how much money are you uh, directing at this threat? Again, I could see if I could give you specific numbers, but I don't have those off the top of my head. I will tell you, uh, which is sometimes surprising to people, that our criminal programs, our traditional criminal programs, which include exactly the kind of thing you're talking about, remain, even to this day, with all the national security threats that, that get so much discussion, remain our biggest um, number of agents, our biggest allocation of resources. And violent crime, different sorts of violent crime within the criminal program is by far and away the biggest chunk. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Lofgren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and thanks to you, uh, Director Ray, for your service uh, to our country. I want to thank uh, especially uh, the Bureau for the diligence with which uh, you have pursued those who attacked the Capitol and the Capitol Police and essentially attacked uh, our democratic uh, system of government on January 6th. We wish you well in those efforts. I have a, a couple of questions about the rule of law. We all believe in the rule of law, and we think that, and I know you do too, that the rule of law applies to the government as well. Leads me to a question about section 702 of the FISA uh, law. As uh, you know, there has been a review by the uh, uh, court uh, on the use of FISA, and as you, I'm sure, know in its latest review, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance the Court found a widespread violations of the FBI's internal rules and the law's restrictions on how and when the government may use the information it collects under Section 702. For example, the court found, and I quote, um, uh, compliance in incidents suggesting that the FBI's uh, failure to properly apply its querying standards when searching 702 uh, acquired information was more pervasive than previously uh, believed. In one case, FBI personnel queried foreign intelligence databases for the names of over, one, of over 100 business, religious, civic, and community uh, leaders who'd applied to the FBI Citizen Academy. The court also found dozens of cases where agents had searched uh, warrantless foreign intelligence collections in the course of criminal investigations. Um, in summary, the court expressed concerns about, quote, the apparent widespread violations of safeguards on the use of warrantless collection. Um, in response to all of these uh, criticisms and concerns, the FBI, uh, it seems to be, basically said they had been working on changes, but that had uh, been suspended because of the uh, COVID pandemic uh, protocols. But here's my question, Director Ray. Section 702 was enacted in 2008. The FBI and other intelligence agencies have had more than a decade to implement what the law requires. And yet it's 2021, and the FISA court is still finding, this isn't the first time, still finding widespread violations and failures uh, where the FBI uses basically the hook of foreign surveillance, but it's using it to avoid its warrant, re warrant requirements for domestic law enforcement. Why is this happening? Well, Congressman, uh, I obviously want to make sure, and I'm fiercely committed to making sure, that the FBI complies with FISA in all respects. Uh, the FISA court's concerns are certainly concerns that I take especially seriously as somebody who's a former prosecutor, former defense attorney, uh, former assistant attorney general in charge of the criminal division and now FBI director, our relationship with and our candor with and our transparency with and the confidence that we earn with the court is of utmost importance to me. Now, the, the opinion that you are referring to from the court 
uh, does approve our procedures, uh, did not, in fact, find abuses or misconduct, and has to deal specifically with the querying, the running of searches in our databases. So but we have taken, we have taken. He also found that you had used, the FBI had used data for internal domestic investigations. That's a violation of the purpose of 702. And I'm, and again, I'm not gonna speak to the specific instances in the report, because I think that would take longer than we have here, uh, among other things, but I would say that we have done a number of things to try to address the issues identified by the court. We have made uh, significant changes to the documentation requirements to assure accountability, oversight requirements, guidance and training enhancements, systems modifications, which may not sound glamorous, but is incredibly important because it helps yes. prevent uh, non-compliance and then last but not least something I particularly want to highlight I created a new a whole new department in the FBI an office of internal auditing headed by a senior partner from a top you know a big four accounting firm uh, who also had prior uh, in his life been an FBI agent uh, and is consulting with an, a premier outside uh, uh, world-class consulting firm to stand up an office of internal audit specifically focused on FISA to ensure that we have a world-class compliance program and world-class internal auditing program to Director make sure that we don't have these gentlemen, issues. The, the general lady's time has expired. If I may, Mr. Chairman, can we get the director to commit to have this individual brief the committee on those procedures? I, I'd be happy to see if we can get the, uh, the committee a briefing on, on what we're doing in this space. Thank you. The, uh, Mr. Thank you. Yield back. Uh, the gentlelady yields back, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to follow up on my colleague. Uh, apparently, Californians think alike today. Uh, in the 20 years that I've sat on the dais and uh, looked at report after report of the FBI failure to comply with FISA and its long history of spying on Americans using this legislation as a backdoor, uh, we've seen a pattern, which is we're promised there are going to be changes, and those changes have not an, uh, occurred. As uh, the gentlelady who just spoke, uh, Ms. Lofgren, would tell you, you're coming up for reauthorization. If the reauthorization were today, based on, and correct me if I'm wrong, the 2019 report by uh, the, inter uh, the Inspector General that found 17 significant errors or omissions and 51 wrong or unsupported factual assertions in Carter Page's uh, domestic spying, if you will, using the FISA statute alone. Um, in, in addition to that, we have numerous people, including judges, who say if they'd known the truth rather than the false statements, they never would have granted those warrants. Uh, so now the question is, should we, first of all, do you agree with those findings that at least some of those uh, 68 errors or omissions are accurate, including one of your own that was prosecuted for it. Well, uh, Congressman, first, let me be clear, just in case there's any confusion to anybody watching, of course, all of these applications were filed before I became FBI director. Uh, no, I, clear. I, and, and, and to be honest, Director, the reason we're, we're having this conversation, Ms. Lofgren and I both, is that it's your watch. And organizations, no matter how great they are, are much like airplane pilots. They're not judged on their safe landings, they're judged on their crashes. And this was clearly a crash, wouldn't you say? Well, uh, what I would say is that the Inspector General's report describes conduct that I consider unacceptable, unrepresentative of who the FBI is, and cannot, cannot happen again, which is why I implemented over 40 corrective measures promptly after the Inspector General's report came out, accepted every single finding in the Inspector General's report, implemented every single recommendation in the Inspector General's report, went above and beyond, installed an entirely new leadership team at the FBI, created this new Office of Internal Auditing that I just mentioned to Congresswoman Lofgren. I can go on and on and on, but let me let me significant Let me not let you go on and on just because of short time and ask you, uh, what assurances can you give us today that a current audit would not find current failures? Well, as somebody who's worked deeply with auditing firms for all sorts of organizations, 
the point of an audit is to find problems. And so I, I can't sit here and tell you that, that no audit would find a problem. That's why we have an auditing problem, is to find the problems and fix them. And that's what we're gonna do. It, uh, some time ago under your predecessor, he came before this Congress and uh, defended a, uh, a, a warrant, an unusual one, one that ordered the company Apple to develop software to allow for a backdoor uh, purportedly to be on one iPhone uh, used in San Bernardino by a, a murderer, a terrorist, but in fact they were asking for software that allowed it to be external. Your predecessor claimed that you did not have the technical capability to decipher it. Shortly after that, uh, a, uh, a, pr a college professor showed that for about $300 you could have done it and yet you paid $1 million to an Israeli firm who did it. Today, can you assure us that you have the tools that you apparently did not have, or would we have to assume that you'd have to ask a professor for a $300 solution or the Israelis for a $1 million solution? Well, as you could imagine, uh, the technology continues to improve both for the bad guys and for the good guys. Um, and so it's not a static situation. But well, even, knowing, but, knowing but that even and knowing today, that even knowing today. that there have been two recent failures uh, in cyber attacks, uh, what assurances can you give this committee that you have the resources and a plan to be on the leading edge of cyber rather than the trailing edge of cyber, which appears to be where we are in a number of areas? Uh, we constantly need more resources to get further and further ahead of the bad guys in this particular space. The technology in terms of encryption, which is sort of the point you're getting at with the Apple example, uh, has continued to advance in a way that's actually making it harder and harder for law enforcement, not just the FBI, but all across this country, uh, to get into encrypted devices and certainly encrypted messaging platforms. We saw that, for example, down in Congressman Gates' district in Pensacola with the, Na uh, the Naval Air Station attack there. And we tried to get into Apple's uh, iPhone, the device that the terrorists there use. And by the way, he took the time in the middle of the attack to shoot the phone. Think about the presence of mind that he has to have in the middle of that to do that, to try to prevent us from getting into his phone. Our folks were able, in that instance, to reconstruct the phone. Uh, and because of a of a fluke in that particular instance, we were able to actually get into the device, but it took months and months and months and hours and hours and hours and hours and lots and lots and lots of taxpayer money to get there. And only then, after not having gotten the cooperation that we really could have used from Apple at the front end, we found out that that particular terrorist had been in communication with Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula right on up till the night before the attack, not known at the time that the attack was disrupted. He, so it's an illustration of what a challenge this is for law enforcement, and it affects terrorist investigations. It affects an issue that I know is near and dear to every member of this committee, child sexual exploitation investigations. Uh, and it's something that I hear about. I've been to talk to law enforcement yeah. in all 50 states, and I hear about it from chiefs and sheriffs mm -hmm. in every state about this issue. So mm -hmm. it is top of mind. We are bringing technical tools, using money that Congress appropriates to us to deal with it. The gentleman, we're moving in a direction where we're going darker and darker, so I appreciate uh, very much your concern. The gentleman's time is well expired. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your service and the FBI agents across the nation. Since 2019, the United States has experienced a steep rise in hate crimes. African Americans have been targeted in 48.5% of all hate crimes, while hate incidences targeting Latinx have risen 8.7%, anti-Semitic hate incidents have risen by 14%, and anti-Asian hate incidents have risen by nearly 150%. Director Ray, my time is short. These questions should give just a brief response. Is the Bureau prioritizing its investigations into violent hate crimes? Uh, yes, very much so, uh, and I could give you more information. It just depends on how much you, you would like here. Uh, uh, you'll have an opportunity. Okay. Uh, what percentage of domestic terrorism cases investigated by the FBI would you now say are motivated by white supremacist type ideology? Well, I'm not sure that I could give you a percentage. Uh, certainly on the domestic terrorism side, um, we have elevated, I did back in June, summer of 2019, 
racially motivated violent extremism to our very top threat priority band consistent with ISIS. Um, and the biggest chunk of that by far and away, the vast majority of that is racially motivated violent extremists advocating for the superior. And you would say that still today? Yes. Thank you. Uh, now let's uh, direct our attention uh, to the beating of law enforcement in Washington on January 6th. On January 6th, the domestic terrorists who beat law enforcement officers and breached the citadel of democracy of the United States wore insignias of white supremacist groups, waved Confederate flags, hung a noose on the lawn, and they were shouting racial epithets. As indicated, the NYPD sent a packet of raw intelligence concerning potential, excuse me, potential violence. Why did the FBI not issue a formal threat assessment with all of that information, including an assessment at headquarters? Well, I don't know about a formal threat assessment. As I was mentioning in response to an earlier question, we did put out uh, quite a number, I think a dozen or so intelligence products specifically geared towards domestic violent extremism and election-related domestic on that violent day? extremism. On that day? On well, January 6th? Over the course of 20, leading up to and right on up to and including December, the month. Can I get that in writing as to the details of how that progress and whether there was a threat assessment on that day. I need to, to move on, and I thank you very much. Uh, you know that the Norfolk FBI office, as indicated, had an SIR report, situational information report. These are the words, be ready to fight. Congress needs to hear glass breaking, doors being kicked in, and blood from their BLM, Black Lives Matter, and Antifa slave soldiers being spilled. Get violent. Stop calling this a march or a rally or a protest. Get ready for war. Would you agree that these words clearly could indicate racial bias and attempt to use race and racism as a potential uh, motive for violence? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I tracked all the, the words in the quote that you read, but certainly the Norfolk uh, situational information report, the information that was online was concerning enough that it was provided, as I said, within. It had uh, Black Lives Matter, slave soldiers, has some racial overtones. Absolutely, of course. Uh, let me, as you well know, you just heard me recount the, the Norfolk, the NYPD. Was the FBI aware of any online threats uh, to the Vice President, the Speaker of the House, and specific members of Congress connected with January 6th? Uh, well, I, I can't think of any sitting here right now. Uh, certainly, we uh, were aware of and discussed uh, a lot of online chatter that was out there. I'm going to um, move on. But, Thank you. But I'm not aware of any. any on the day of, did headquarters uh, contact the vice president? Did they contact the Speaker of the House? And did they contact FBI, contact any member of Congress on the day of January 6th? Did any member of the FBI have any yes. contact with any member headquarters of Headquarters, I'm going to speak of, your office. Well, well I, I, I know that there was interaction between... Uh, I'm going to ask for that in writing as well, maybe. Okay. Yes, I thank you. Let me um, go to the connection of race and, and uh, the President of the United States, former President. On December 19th, the former President indicated big protests in D.C. on January 6th. There, be there, will be wild. 12.15 on January 6th, he said, you'll never take back our country with weakness. At 1.10 p.m., President Trump said, we fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. At 2.11, rioters breached police lines on the west side of the Capitol. Director Ray, these words do indicate that uh, the former president, Donald Trump, helped motivate the domestic terrorist attack on January 6th. Have any of these words been reviewed to determine whether or not President Trump uh, words and deeds should be referred to the Department of Justice as contributing to the violence of the insurrectionists on January 6th? The gentlelady's time has expired. The witness may answer the question. I'm not sure there's a whole lot I can add on that subject, but if there's something I can provide uh, in follow-up, I'm happy to. I, I asked if you, if you referred these actions or deeds of the president, you're the investigatory agency, to the Department of Justice. Donald Trump's we, actions, words, deeds on that day. Uh, I'm not aware of any investigation that specifically goes to that, but we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of investigations related to January 6th involving lots and lots of different pieces of it, uh, and I want to be careful not to speak with Well, maybe I can get that back in writing. I thank Thanks. you. Mr. Chairman, if I might just put on the record for a letter back. Um, there are only 4.7 percent African Americans in the FBI. Uh, much has come to my attention of the lack of promotion opportunities for leadership in the FBI. 
uh, and the diversity office that you now have does not report directly to the FBI director. Would you please provide me in writing of where we are with diversity in the FBI and as it relates to minorities and specifically African Americans? Gentlelady. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady yields back, Mr. Gomer. Thank you. Um, Director Ray, we know from the Arizona case, the Supreme Court said that uh, state local law enforcement were not to enforce immigration laws, but isn't it true that local and state law enforcement officers can enforce state and local law if, uh, even if the, uh, the defendant is uh, in the country illegally? Well, I want to be a little bit careful since I, uh, the last time I looked at that issue was back in the uh, 2001 2 3 range when I was a, a lawyer at the Justice Department. But Look, my, recollection my time is, is very similar. short. My it's an easy question. To yours. My, my recollection is similar to yours, but I'm yes. not speaking well, as a lawyer right now. Okay, it is the case, and I hope you'll refresh your recollection and your legal training. So uh, it seems that since the federal government is welcoming basically by its tactics, by its handling of the massive surge across our border um, in such a way to continue to encourage it that uh, uh, there is massive destruction to landowners property. It sounds like understanding the criminal trespass laws of Texas that perhaps landowners on the border ought to have no trespassing signs, including in Spanish so that local law enforcement can protect the country um, while they're protecting the local property owners. Uh, there was a question about uh, also the, um, the FISA court, and I'm still, as a former judge, particularly disturbed that no FISA judge um, felt strongly enough about uh, people not lying in applications for warrants that they took action for contempt of court, but should DOJ officials that sign applications for warrants before the FISA court actually read them before they certify that they're true and correct? Uh, certainly it's my practice when, I, when, as FBI director, I'm signing applications to- You do read them. them. I do review them, yes, absolutely. And I would commend you for that, and I would ask you to look in- They're not short, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, they're yeah. usually lengthy. Yeah. But I would uh, commend your looking into uh, Mr. Rosenstein's uh, inability to uh, testify that he uh, actually read those uh, regarding the Trump campaign before he signed them. Um, the night before January 6th, January 5th, that evening I was talking to Capitol Police officers and I said, you know, let's face it, uh, most of the conservatives that come, they don't have any intention of being violent. And they said, well, we've been briefed today that uh, there's a good bit of, uh, it's understood, online activity, that there are people that are going to be coming that hate Trump, but they're going to dress up in red, MAGA, Trump, paraphernalia to try to blend in and create trouble. Um, we had Capitol Police Chief Sun testify that uh, they got no information from U.S. Intel or from the DOJ, FBI, of any threat of the nature that came about. Did the FBI have information about the violent threat that occurred on January 6th, on January 5th? Well, the answer to that is complicated, unfortunately. So we have the, we've already talked about a little bit here this morning. It shouldn't Before be but, complicated. You either had information or you didn't. That was my question. Different, so there's different kinds of information. We had the online chatter that we just talked about and the Norfolk, so-called Norfolk SIR, Situational Information Report has that. But what we did not have, to my did knowledge. Did you pass any of that information on to Chief uh, Sund? We passed the Norfolk information onto the Capitol Police in three different ways, uh, as well as to- Okay, the well you were careful to note that most of the protesters who were left this last summer uh, were basically peaceful. 
but you haven't said that about the 100, 200,000 people that showed up on January 6th. Do you know how many people actually came into the Capitol on January 6th uh, that were unauthorized? I don't have an exact number. I do know that we have uh, now are approaching around 500 arrests. But to be clear, to your point about peaceful, the way I, th I think is a fair description of January 6th is there's sort of three groups of people, almost like an inverse pyramid. First group, biggest number of people who showed up kind of outside, maybe not on the Capitol grounds, uh, were peaceful, maybe rowdy, but peaceful protesters. Then there's a second group that were people who, uh, for whatever reason, engaged in, let's say, the next level of criminal conduct, trespass, et cetera. Uh, and that is criminal, that is a violation, and it needs, those laws need to be enforced. And then there's the third group, uh, which is where you're seeing a lot of the arrests and a lot of the more significant charges that are coming out of our work right now, which are the people who brought all sorts of weapons, uh, you know, Kevlar, tactical vests, uh, you know, bear spray. Firearms? What's that? Anybody bring yeah, firearms? Gentlemen. Uh, we have, I can think of at least one instance where there was an individual with a gun inside the Capitol, but for the most part, the weapons were weapons other than firearms. But General, there's three groups, and it's hard to paint with one broad brush every single individual. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Cohen is Mr. unmuted. Mr. Cohen? I'm unmuted now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director Ray. You've done an admirable job so far in foot soldiers in the January 6th insurrection. Kind of like going after Al Capone and getting all of the lottery sales tickets, the, the people that, that do the bootlegging in the, in the streets. You, to the best of my knowledge, haven't done anything to go after the people who incited the riot, the big bosses, the leaders, which is Donald Trump. Do you have any investigation or have you done anything to look into Trump's activity on a, the day of the insurrection, subpoena records of the White House of phone calls in and out and of meetings that he and Roger Stone and others may have had with leaders of these groups? Well, uh, again, uh, Congressman, uh, somewhat along the lines of something I said earlier, because we have uh, not one but now close to 500 pending criminal cases, all of which are in the hands of judges who feel very strongly about how much I discuss uh, pending cases, I want to be careful about that. We have uh, brought, in addition to what you're describing as kind of the lower level type offenses, we have now started to bring a number of conspiracy charges yes, of various Ray. individuals. Yes, I think there's about 30 plus individuals who have been charged with Ray, conspiracy. Ray, yes, sir. I appreciate and understand that, but I'm talking about Mr. Big, number one. Have you gone after the people who incited the riot? Well, I'm, I don't think it'd be appropriate for me to be discussing whether or not we are or, or aren't uh, investigating specific individuals. I just oh, don't think I'll, that's appropriate. I'll accept that. I would urge you to do it. He said, come to Washington on the day of the Electoral College, a month earlier, no other day. And he said, it will be big and it will be wild. I read that as violence to occur. And I was with a Capitol policeman on Sunday. He said, yes, they had information that said it was going to be violent. You and the FBI did not make the case. You should have warned and you had a duty to do that. Uh, let me ask you this. You, have you seen Mr. McGahn's testimony yet? No, sir. I urge you to look. I don't know if you can do anything without the direction of the Attorney General, but it appears Mr. McGahn was told to lie by the President about trying wanting to fire officials that would have resulted in obstruction of justice. I urge you to look at it. Can you act on that testimony independent of the Attorney General? Well, I, I think we have uh, very specific rules about predication um, and approval on certain kinds of investigations, so I'd have to look at, at whatever information you wanted to send our way, and we can take a look at the information and evaluate whether or not there's action we could take. It's in the de deposition, and it's clear that McGahn said that the president told him to lie, and the president also to lie. Uh, I would urge you to look at that and talk to Director Garland of 
Attorney General Garland about that. Did you infiltrate the crowds of the BLM Black Lives Matter protests in Washington when they were in Washington? Congressman, we don't infiltrate protests as a general rule, certainly. When it comes to criminal activity, we have specific rules covered by the Attorney General guidelines and the so-called DIAG, which is our implementation of the Attorney General guidelines that cover what we can and cannot do. And we would have followed those scrupulously, not just in general, but in the specific period that you're talking about. We don't investigate First Amendment activity. We investigate threats of criminal activity. Thank you, Director. I know First Amendment activity is protected, but was your activities on January 6th different from what it was with Black Lives Matter? Did you observe? Did you try to get more knowledge about what was going on after you had the Norfolk information about the January 6th insurrection? Well, the Norfolk information that we've talked about here arrived essentially the night before or the afternoon before January 6th and was promptly passed on. At that point, it was raw, unverified information that we hadn't yet had a chance to vet. But, of course, we decided that even though it was raw and unverified, we needed to pass it on to all of our partners, both in the command post and throughout the Joint Terrorism Task Force, to make sure they had it. Director Wray, thank you. I only have a few seconds left. You have compared ransomware to 9-11. Ransomware is awful and it's a problem. 9-11 was awful. But the insurrection on our capital, unlike anything known since the Civil War, is also awful. Where would you compare the insurrection and would you admit that it was an insurrection on our capital with the assault on our country on January 11th? The gentleman's time has expired. The witness may answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me just say that I don't think any attack, ransomware or January 6th, can fairly be compared to the horror of September 11th and the 3,000 or so individuals who lost their lives that day. And that attack and my engagement with the victims in my last time in government was a big part of why I came back into this role in the first place. My reference to September 11th in context of ransomware was not about the attack, but about how the country came together in response. Now, certainly, when it comes to January 6th, it's a unique type of attack, not just in terms of the number of individuals, but in terms of the effort to disrupt a key part of our constitutional system and the peaceful transition of government, which is such a hallmark of our country. So it's a very significant attack in and of its own right. And certainly we have, as we've already talked about, close to 500 arrests. We have all of our field offices fully engaged, and the amount of manpower devoted to it is extremely significant for one attack, absolutely. The gentleman yields back to Mr. Shabbat. Thank you. Director Wray, since you last testified before this committee, our country has faced increased threats, be it malware and ransomware to our computer networks, gang members crossing our southern border and committing horrific crimes here within the United States, groups like Antifa attempting to burn down federal courthouses, the January 6th attack, as we've mentioned, on the Capitol, and the surge of illicit drugs killing so many Americans. We are facing multiple national security threats, all of which need the full attention of agencies like the one that you oversee, the FBI. I'll first ask you about cyber attacks. Ransomware terrorists have brazenly disrupted the operations of countless hospitals, schools, city governments, emergency services, even our congressional offices, and an untold number of businesses because they typically pay the ransom quietly. Last fall, cyber criminals were able to compromise patient records and personal information from a hospital in a senior living community in my district, and more recently, high-profile ransomware attacks on Colonial Pipeline and JBS meat processing company caused major disruptions to our oil and food supply. I've seen it estimated that there's a victim of a ransomware attack every 11 seconds 
that they're already costing us $20 billion a year and that you've compared the challenge, as Mr. Cohen mentioned, to the September 11, 2001 attack on our nation. Mr. Director, the Biden administration, basically, I mentioned the attack on the Colonial Pipeline, basically gave a wink and a nod to paying off the thugs. And I know some of that money was gotten back, but don't we need to clarify the policy relative to paying off criminals? Aren't we just inviting more attacks when you pay off these thugs? Well, Congressman, I appreciate the question, and I share your concern about, and that's partly why I've made some of the comments that I've made publicly about the effect of ransomware and the threat that it poses and the challenge and what it requires from all of us to deal with it. It is our policy, it is our guidance from the FBI that companies should not pay the ransom for a number of reasons. One, the one that you mentioned, which is that it encourages more of this kind of activity. But then there's second, some more practical issues, which sometimes the encryption or the locking up of the system that the actors engage in may not be undone. You could pay the ransom and not get your system back, and that's not unknown to happen. But the third and the most important thing is whether the company pays or not, what we really need is to make sure that the companies or other organizations who are victimized reach out and coordinate with the FBI and with our partners as quickly and promptly as possible. And it's when they do that enables us to take all sorts of creative action that we can't always do, but that certain cases we can, and speed matters, which is why, for example, in the colonial instance, we were able to essentially seize and confiscate the clear majority of the ransom that was extracted. In other cases, again, not common, but it does happen, we're able to actually get the encryption keys and unlock the system even without the company paying the ransom. And so the whole bunch of things we can do to prevent this activity from occurring if, whether they pay the ransom or not, they communicate and coordinate and work closely with law enforcement right out of the gate. That's, I think, the most important part. Thank you, Mr. Director. I got two more questions. I only have time for one. The Centers for Disease Control announced that there's been an increase in overdose deaths. The prevalence of fentanyl is the main thing. It comes from China, it comes across our southern border. Myself, I, and Bob Latta have introduced legislation relative to fentanyl analogs, which are very similar, can be changed, they get around the law with that. But my question to you is relative to fentanyl and the analogs as well. The chaos at our southern border, doesn't this play right into the drug cartels, the current policies down there on the southern border? Isn't more of that drug coming in and killing far too many Americans? Don't we really need to control that southern border? Well, I absolutely agree that the security situation at the southwest border is of great concern, both from a perspective of drug trafficking, human trafficking, violence on both sides of the border, corruption, et cetera. And certainly we are trying to do our part to contribute to that because, as you mentioned, the scourge of opioids, opioid abuse, fentanyl in particular, is something that is sweeping the country. And I know that in your home state, that's a particularly significant concern. We, from our end, are trying to attack the problem through a variety of means. We're going after not just the professionals, the prescribers from that end of it. We're going after the dark web where it's trafficked there. We're going after the gangs that distribute it here locally. We're going after the source through our transnational organized crime efforts. So there's a whole bunch of things that we're doing with our partners. But make no mistake, this goes beyond, way beyond law enforcement into other agencies and, frankly, the community as well. Gentlemen, his time has expired. Gentlemen, yields back. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, I want to thank you for appearing before us today and also for your service to the nation. As I was preparing for this hearing, I researched hate crimes data for my state of Georgia. 
And I was troubled by the data that I found, or more precisely, what I didn't find. We clearly have a deeply flawed system for collecting hate crimes data, which has left us with unreliable and incomplete counts. The hesitation to report, investigate, and designate incidents as hate crimes demonstrates a deep-rooted failure of our justice system. One thing is clear. Since the start of the pandemic, we've seen a significant rise in anti-Asian and anti-Chinese rhetoric. And in March of this year, eight people were tragically murdered in a mass shooting in Atlanta, and six of those individuals murdered were women of Asian descent. At a press conference the next day, a police officer, a police official famously told those assembled that the shooter had, quote, had a bad day, end quote. And Director Ray, two days after the murders, you said in an interview with NPR, quote, while the motive remains still under investigation at the moment, it does not appear that the motive was racially motivated, end quote. Many people believe, Director Ray, that law enforcement reluctance to designate a homicide as a hate crime does a disservice to the victims and fails to prevent similar future crimes. Certainly, comments such as yours during an in ongoing investigation do not help the cause. Wasn't it inappropriate for you, sir, to infer to the press that you didn't believe that the murders of the six Asian women was a hate crime when, as you said, the motive was still under investigation? Well, certainly, as, as you know, Congressman, um, because that's my home city as well, uh, my heart aches for the victims of that attack, um, and I grieve with their families. Uh, in the instance in oh. question, I think the comment I made was consistent with the information we had at the time, uh, but I, I regret if anyone's um, reaction to that uh, was otherwise. Well, I submit to you, sir, that such comments by the director of the FBI were not only harmful to the ongoing investigation, but also diminished already waning community confidence in law enforcement. I want to shift now to another uh, issue. Under current law, only those convicted of domestic terrorism-related felonies or hate crimes are prohibited from possessing firearms, but those convicted of misdemeanors that have a nexus to domestic terrorism or misdemeanor hate crimes may possess firearms without restriction. Would you agree that Congress should consider expanding the prohibition on the possession of firearms to those convicted of violent misdemeanors that are related to domestic terrorism and are violent hate crimes? Well, uh, I don't think it's, I'm in a position as FBI director to comment on specific legislative proposals, but I'm happy to uh, provide operational input to, to you if, uh, or have the FBI do so uh, with your staff. Certainly, I share the goal of making sure that those uh, who are prohibited by law from possessing firearms don't get their hands on the firearms, and certainly to the extent that there are things that can be done to uh, protect the public, we want to do that. That's why our NICS uh, uh, section up in West Virginia process and last year processed, I think, a record almost 40 million background checks. <laughs> Uh, of firearms right through the, the middle of the pandemic. Um, so we are trying to do our part to make sure that the laws on the books related to firearms are enforced uh, and that those who are not supposed to have firearms don't get them. Uh, individual well, okay, states okay, have let me, let, laws. Let me on stop you there. I got one more issue I want to talk about. Uh, when you were here last year, you mentioned the creation of the domestic terrorism hate crimes fusion cell. Uh, can you provide us with some insight into how the fusion cell operates? And to be clear, is it just one cell or are there multiple cells? I, I appreciate very much the question. So this is something that I stood up about a year and a half or so ago, um, bringing together the domestic terrorism expertise that we have together with the hate crimes expertise which we have, which is more in the civil rights program. Uh, and together, the goal was to try to be more proactive and to try to do a better job of 
anticipating and preventing hate crimes. And so, for example, we're very proud of the success that that cell helped create uh, in Colorado, where we were able to prevent a, uh, an attack, a, terror, uh, a hate crime uh, against a synagogue, uh, I've forgotten the city in Colorado, but that was a big part of what came out of that fusion cell. The fusion cell is one cell in headquarters, but it, uh, it works with all of our field offices uh, and helps coordinate that effort. And again, the whole goal is to try to be ahead of the threat. That's the point of it. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There has been a cover-up regarding the origins of coronavirus. We see it in the Fauci emails. We see it in the G7's call today to renew an inquiry into those origins. We see it in the Biden administration's efforts to squelch investigation into the origins of the coronavirus. And I want to figure out what side the FBI is on. On April 28th, Dr. Li Ming Yan landed at LAX. One of your agents interviewed her at that time. She then traveled to New York. Your agent from Los Angeles followed her to New York and sought an interview on both the 1st of May and the 2nd of May in 2020. The FBI took Dr. Li Ming Yang's phone on which the doctor showed evidence of WeChat communications between herself and the director of the CDC in Beijing, all the way dating back to December of 2019 regarding the Chinese military's involvement in the development of the virus and specific links to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Director Ray, when did you become aware of your agency's interface with Dr. Yang? When did you review those WeChat messages? Um, I'm not sure that there's much I can say about any specific investigation. I will say that a couple things. One, um, as I think, I think you know and I think the committee knows, I have been very vocal and I intend to continue to be very vocal about the counterintelligence threat which takes a wide variety of forms from the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party. And I think it's one of the most significant threats facing this country. Is Dr. Yan part of that threat? Well, I, I, again, I want to, don't want to speak specifically about any particular investigation. But the second thing I would mention is that... Well, here's, here's why that's important. Yeah. On, on the first thing, Director A, you know, back in, October, or in you know, April and May of 2020, we didn't have six, nearly 600,000 people dead as a result of the coronavirus. On October 14th, 2020, FBI agent Andrew Zittman brought a scientist who was working with the FBI to meet with Dr. Yan in New York on October 14th. They met for nearly six hours. Can you tell us anything about that meeting and what it tells us about the origins of this virus? It is simply unacceptable to sit here a year later and say you're not going to tell us whether or not there was information about the origins of the virus when it is so central to the safety and health of our fellow Americans. I, I certainly understand the, the point of the question. Again, I, I have to be careful not to discuss specific investigations. Um, I will say that in addition to our investigative work, uh, as I think has been recently publicly stated by uh, the DNI and I think even the President himself, the intelligence community has been looking at this issue. There are differences of view within the intelligence community about the origins of the coronavirus totally and so understand forth. All that. I'm, uh, I'm and trying we're to resolve taking a, those differences a deeper with dive on that subject. So, Director Ray, it, it, we are unable to hold the Chinese Communist Party accountable if we throw our hands in the air and say, well, there's differences of opinion. We have to assess whether those differences are similarly rooted in fact. That's why I need the facts from you. Will you provide to this committee any scientific analysis that the FBI has done regarding Dr. Yan's claims, regarding the messages she provided to you regarding Beijing's knowledge of the origins of this virus, their military's involvement, and even efforts to try to present to the world a fake genome sequence at the beginning of, of these developments? I'm, I'm happy to see what information we can provide. I will have my staff follow up with yours and see what information we can share on you the subject. You get that if, if we don't look at that rooted information, we're unable to ascertain what differences of opinion are correct and incorrect, but it, it's hard to believe that the FBI didn't believe Dr. Yan was credible or significant because she lands on April 28th. Your agent, Dana Murphy, takes her phone that day. I'm holding the receipt from where you got the phone that had the WeChat messages that had very important information regarding Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party. And it's not every day that an FBI agent flies from Los Angeles to New York 
to follow a Chinese doctor who is a whistleblower and a fact witness. And even if Dr. Yan's technical analysis of the vir virus is incorrect, the fact that she showed up saying that she wanted to provide information and tell the truth seems significant today. Now, back when Dr. Yan made these pronouncements regarding the Chinese Communist Party, their military involvement, the leak of this virus from the lab, we had a number of people trying to discredit her. Are you able to ascertain whether or not that effort to discredit Dr. Yan is part of the counterintelligence efforts by the Chinese Communist Party? Again, I, I want to be careful both about what information we can provide in general about any kind of ongoing investigation, but also about what in form that information would take, because in some cases you may be touching on things that would be classified, and that might require a different format. So I, I certainly understand why you're asking the questions. Let me commit to you that I will go back with my folks and see what information can be provided and what form it would have to take if we can provide any. That would be very the helpful. Time uh, uh, is uh, Mr. Chairman, may, time I be, is may I be recognized? Mr. Deitch. Oh, wait, hold on, Mr. Chairman. You let everybody else go over for a minute. May I be recognized just for unanimous consent request? The gentleman's time has expired, You're not Mr. treating Deitch. everyone equally, Mr. Chairman. You went over by more than gentleman's a minute. Gentleman's time. Johnson went over by 45 seconds. Gentleman's right? time has expired, Mr. Deitch. What? I just want a unanimous consent thank request. You, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You want a uh, unanimous consent Gregory, for what? To, to get oh, 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 the okay, I'm sorry. Just a UC is all. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record the receipt from the United States Department of Justice wherein Dr. Yang's phone was taken by FBI agent Dana Murphy. Without objection, uh, without objection, gentlemen's time has expired, Mr. Deutsch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director A, first, I want to thank you and all the men and women in the FBI uh, for what you do every day to keep us safe. I also want to extend my condolences, my sympathy to the families of Special Agent Alpha and Special Agent Schwarzenberger who were shot and killed while serving a warrant in Sunrise, Florida, just south of my district. Um, I also, uh, Director A, would like to just follow up on some of the things that, um, that you've touched on today. First of all, you said uh, just a, a little while ago that 9-11 was uh, why you returned to public service. And I, I just wanted just to follow up on that, the 9-11 the community, as you know, Director Ray, has asked the FBI to conduct a full and complete declassification review of all documents related to the September 11th attacks. It has been nearly 20 years now since that horrific day, and these families, the American people, I think, deserve this. And so I would just ask whether you will commit to conducting a full and complete declassification review. Uh, we are working very hard on trying to declassify as much information as we can and to share as much information as we can. Um, I understand why this is frustrating uh, to uh, any number of families, um, and we will commit to continuing to try to provide as much information as we responsibly can. I, I would urge you to I would urge you to, to pursue a full declassification review. Uh, I want to just follow up on on the responses on your responses. Uh, both to Chairman uh, Nadler and to Mr. Cohen about the Norfolk memo. Um, you said that um, we tried to make sure the information got to the right people. You said you tried three ways. You emailed it to Capitol Police. Uh, you did a verbal briefing uh, in command post, including Capitol Police, and, uh, and that you used the law enforcement portal that all law enforcement partners have access to. You, you then went on to tell Mr. Cohen that the information arrived essentially, I think you said, the night or afternoon before January 6th and was promptly passed on, but it was raw, unverified. Uh, we decided that even though it was raw and unverified, we need to pass it on to all of our partners, um, which you did. You didn't explain, and I would ask you to explain, what happened next? Well, you passed it on, and what did you do to follow up with this really important information about what, what may take place the next day in the United States Capitol? Um, well, I, I'm not sure that there's specific investigative activity that I could discuss. I think the, the point of passing this information on, we didn't know what to make of it, and that's why I emphasized that it was raw, unverified information uh, without a specific identity attached to it. But the judgment was made, which is not the way we prefer to have to do things, but given the, f the framing of the information, we decided out of an abundance of caution to pass it on to, uh, and, I, and sometimes when there's a reference to the email, 
you know, it's important to understand we're talking about their chosen representatives on the Joint Terrorism Task Force, the whole right. purpose of Judge which is Grant. to keep people in the loop. Yes. I, no, I, under, I understand. I, and I understand that's, the, that's their purpose. Um, you had a memo that said uh, that uh, the report that detailed online posts said that individuals in Washington were ready for war at the Capitol, called for potential, it, it talked about potential for violence in Washington, D.C. in connection with planned stop the steal protests on January 6th. That's what was in the memo. I know you've passed it on. What do you do once you've passed it on? And I'm going to ask, I'm asking the question because we're not, at the, at, we don't we don't know what the answer is. We know that this was out there. We don't know whether you did anything other than pass it on through these channels. And it was damning enough information, certainly it seems in retrospect, that though raw, you would have then followed up to make sure that, that every step was followed once you passed on the information. So what happened after you passed it on? Well, I guess the way we look at it is we, we passed it on in not one, not two, but three different ways uh, in order to make sure that it got through to the people uh, who needed to have that information to exercise their responsibilities uh, to engage in the physical security, which is well, not, not what we do. I, 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 I may be missing the point of your question. Not, I, I think so. I, Director Ray, respectfully, I think you are. When you say it's not your responsibility uh, to ensure physical security, you had this memo that foretold or at least suggested what might happen. And I'm going to finish with this, Director Ray. The reason this is so upsetting to me in particular is because it just reminds me too much of the two tips that the FBI got before the mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. One to someone in Mississippi who saw a troubling YouTube comment. The other, after receiving a 13-minute-long voicemail with troubling details about the shooter, that was closed as having said there was no lead value. I understand you thought that there were, this was worth passing on, but it seems like there should have been more than simply saying it was the night before, it came in late, we just passed it on through our channels. That's all our responsibility uh, to do. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, you articulated in your opening statement that perhaps the top concern in our country right now is the prevalence of violence and violent crime in our communities, and I, I think we all agree with that. But one of the other serious concerns that we have is the decreasing amount of faith that many Americans have in our institutions. And uh, among the most important of our institutions in America, of course, is our system of justice. And over the past few years, millions of Americans have begun to question whether we can still rely upon the maximum of equal justice under law and whether justice is blind and all the rest. One of the reasons for this is the very real perception that some individuals within the DOJ and FBI have abused their authority and engaged in selective enforcement of certain statutes. One example that comes to mind is the Foreign Agents Registration Act. So I wanted to ask you if you're aware that during Special Counselor Mueller's probe, there were at least five indictments of conservatives under FARA and, and if you know how that compares to the prevalence of previous FARA prosecutions since the enactment of that statute more than 80 years ago. I'm probably not the right person to uh, provide a whole lot of information about Special Counsel Mueller's investigation. I'd rather, that's probably better referred to what's left of, of that office, I suppose. But uh, certainly FARA that you're referring to uh, is an extremely important tool uh, that we in the FBI have been pushing for a while to be using more aggressively, uh, in particular against the, the Chinese threat, because so much of it is reflected through people engaged in activity uh, that we think could appropriately be pursued under FARA. So exactly how it compares, I'm not sure I have that information. Well, here's the, here's the point. We agree with that, and I think we need to be aggressive against the CCP for sure. We're all on the same page there. But according to reports, there were as many FARA prosecutions during the previous 40 years as there were during the 18 months of the Mueller probe. The, the, George Papadopoulos, for example, stated that he was given the choice to either, quote, accept the charge that I lied or face FARA charges, and that while FARA has been widely ignored for years, the special counsel's office has dusted the statute off as a prime weapon to get members of the Trump circle to talk, right, unquote. 
Um, the FBI and the Justice Department used FARA throughout their investigation into Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, but nothing ever came from those charges. Uh, the Justice Department stated in its motion to dismiss the case that the FBI's closing communication, quote, made clear that the FBI had found no basis to predicate further investigative efforts into whether Mr. Flynn was being directed and controlled by a foreign power, Russia in that case, in a manner that threatened U.S. national security or violated FARA or its related statutes, unquote. So the question is, it, it, it seems to a lot of Americans that alleged FARA violations were used as either a pretext to investigate those with ties to President Trump or that FARA charges were used to pressure those conservatives in a bid to find a connection between the Trump campaign and Russia. So regardless of the details of the Mueller probe, I get that you're not the, the expert on that. The question is, how could anyone see this otherwise? Doesn't it look like that was selective enforcement? I certainly understand the, the purpose of the question, the point of the question. I, I'm not sure that I can really speak to what people would perceive. Mm -hmm. um, what I can say is that, again, separate from the special counsel's investigation, which is really respectfully probably not my place to comment on, uh, I do think that more aggressive use of the Foreign Agents Registration Act uh, is something that former Attorney General Barr and I, for example, discussed quite a bit and trying to use it more aggressively than it had been used in the past, partly for the reason we've already talked about. On June 3rd of this year, Politico reported that the Justice Department is now investigating a Democrat lobbying firm for failing to comply with FARA and its representation of Burisma Holdings while Hunter Biden served on its board. And up until about a week ago, this, this, uh, when this news was first reported, there was a, a very real perception that enhanced enforcement is being used only against Republicans and conservatives. So the question is, can you confirm the FBI's commitment to fervently pursue these violations, as you said, more aggressively, but to do it regardless of the political party affiliations of the subject of the investigation? I think political party affiliations should have zero place in our decision to enforce the Foreign Agents Registration Act or any other statute. Um, and you can be sure that as long as I have anything to say about it, we're going to enforce it in an even-handed way uh, without respect to anybody's political affiliation. I got 19 seconds left. I'll just say that even hand and this perception that we're talking about is increasingly important in our republic because if people can't, if they don't have faith in a system of justice, if they think that Lady Justice is a symbol, has the blindfold up and she's peering beneath it, then we lose a, an important element that holds the republic together. I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you for your time. Gentleman yield, gentleman yields back, Ms. Bass. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for your service, uh, Director Ray. And I also want to thank you for finally abandoning the category of black identity extremists likely motivated to target law enforcement. My understanding now is that there is a new category, racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists. And uh, um, I'm actually concerned about this as well. I'm concerned about it because of the FBI's long history of collapsing black activism in the fight for civil rights against, and especially against police abuse with terrorism. So even in this document, several black individuals and one organization is included along with well-known white supremacist domestic organizations, uh, domestic terrorist organizations. Um, the FBI says from two, 2015 through 2019, approximately 846 individuals were arrested for domestic terrorism. And I wanted to know uh, how many of these were African-American? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I appreciate your comments about uh, the changes we made in response uh, to some of the conversations we had in early in my tenure uh, on the so-called BIE issue. The particular document you're reading from, I'm not sure sitting here right now that I'm, I'm certain which document you're referring to, so maybe the best thing to do there would be for us to have my staff follow up with yours and be sure that I'm answering, yeah. I ask you several other questions. Do you know of any black domestic terrorist organizations? Uh, could, you tell me their, could you tell me their names and what attacks that they have landed? I wanted to know if you consider our, if the movement for black lives or black lives matter uh, is, a, is considered a racially motivated violent extremist organization. Uh, so th th I'm, I appreciate the question because this is something that I think is important for me to be able to clarify really across the spectrum. So the first point that's really important here is that we don't designate 
domestic terrorist organizations, period. Unlike on the foreign terrorist uh, enforcement side, where there's a specific statutory scheme for designating terrorist organizations, there is no such scheme for domestic terrorism, whether it's on the, uh, in the end that you're talking about or any other end. Having and said this, but, 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 but can I, sorry. Organizations as domestic so, terrorists? I'm sorry? I, I couldn't hear the, you flickered out there. You don't, uh, you just said you don't consider, you don't designate organizations as domestic terrorist organizations? That's correct. What we do do is investigate individuals with proper predication. In some instances, those individuals will uh, conspire or engage in criminal conduct with each other and in some cases we will open a conspiracy investigation or so-called enterprise investigation. Uh, you have investigations of black individuals or activists that are involved in the movement around police abuse or civil rights in those categories. And the reason why I'm asking that is because there's a number of Black Lives Matter individuals, leaders who have been visited regularly by the FBI in their homes who had been asked about their plans for various protests, uh, et cetera. Some of those individuals might not be aware that if they misrepresent certain facts to the FBI that they could in fact be committing a crime. And so I wanted to ask you specifically about your surveillance of these organizations. And it's my understanding that there were a couple of protests uh, where the FBI did surveillance and use surveillance aircraft actually. Um, with organizations that were protesting in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore? So we're, we're, we're talking about a, a few different things here. So the first thing is um, we do investigate individuals for criminal activity that occur and violence that occurs in the middle of protests, regardless of what the basis of their protest is. And I really can't speak to specific cases because I would need to know the facts uh, and I would also need to make sure that I wasn't talking about an ongoing investigation. We do not investigate First Amendment groups. We don't investigate people for speech, for association, for assembly, for membership in domestic First Amendment groups. Uh, we have had a few cases that I can think of off the top of my head uh, in the last two years um, involving individuals who committed domestic, what we would consider domestic terror attacks uh, justifying their attacks, lethal attacks, I should add, justifying their attacks based on their interpretation of the so-called black Hebrew Israelite faith. And so that, that's probably the best example that I could give you, but that's about the only thing that comes to mind as we're sitting here talking right now. The gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Buck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director Ray, for your service to our country. And, and I, I want to personally thank you for uh, the great work of the FBI and the uh, case that you mentioned earlier, the synagogue in, in Colorado. Uh, Director Ray, I, I think it's uh, important um, uh, that, that the world knows that, that uh, the people on this committee, certainly I condemn white nationalism, white supremacy, uh, Nazis, um, and I don't think anybody uh, accepts the fact many of our relatives uh, my father uh, fought in World War II to, to rid this planet from the scourge of, of Nazi uh, Germany and, and Nazis generally, and it's upsetting to see any uh, form of Nazi uh, uh, philosophy uh, come back uh, in this country or anywhere else. But there is, uh, in the chairman's uh, opening statement and in some other comments, uh, there seems to be this uh, uh, link between um, white nationalists, white supremacists, Nazis, and hate crimes, as if only uh, white supremacists commit hate crimes. Um, I have seen a number of videos uh, online recently, and uh, uh, it, it appears to me that hate crimes uh, are much broader uh, than that, and I want to get into some other questions, but, but if you could just let me know, is it, is it true that the only hate crimes committed in this country are committed by white nationalists? Uh, no, certainly we've seen hate crimes committed by a variety of individuals. Okay, and uh, one of the concerns I have, and, and I agree with um, my friend Mr. Johnson from Louisiana's comments about the uh, uh, perception among in the public about the even-handedness of uh, law enforcement. I was in law enforcement for 25 years. I, I feel very strongly about the public perception of law enforcement. 
And I think that one of the challenges that we face, uh, we have two very high profile, uh, one a one day riot and, and one a series of riots last summer. And it appears to the public that those uh, uh, activities have been treated differently by the FBI and by, by law enforcement. Oftentimes, I think uh, the, the riots involving Antifa and other groups over the summer in Portland and cities across the United States uh, were handled by local law enforcement um, and not necessarily by the FBI. But because there appears to be a concerted and coordinated effort, um, it seems to me that the FBI would have a role in, uh, in, in investigating those activities. And I just want to give you the opportunity to talk about uh, the, um, the fact that you have 500, uh, as you've mentioned today, prosecutions of the January 6th events at the United States Capitol, and yet we don't see the uh, leadership uh, of Antifa or the money behind. There are news reports, for example, that um, uh, the day after uh, Kenosha, there were rioters there from Portland, from other cities that had converged uh, at, at that location. It appears that those are coordinated efforts, and, and it involves, uh, I don't know how you'd put it any, way, any other way, but, but organized crime. Could you please comment and, and tell the American people uh, how seriously the FBI takes uh, those types of, of domestic terror act activities and, and the fact that there really is no distinction or, or there is a distinction between uh, uh, the FBI's efforts in, in one area and the other? So uh, first to be clear, the FBI has one standard for both, right, which is based on the law, based on the evidence available, uh, based on our effort to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. I can certainly understand, though, I can certainly understand why people might formulate uh, an impression, and part of that has to do with the fact that in a lot of the uh, hundreds, hundreds of investigations we've been conducting related to activity over the course of the summer, uh, in some cases, the most readily provable offense is a state or local charge rather than the availability of a, of a ready-made federal charge. And to some extent, what you're seeing related to January 6th is that because a lot of the activity that was engaged in uh, fairly straightforwardly implicates federal crimes, namely breaching federal property, going inside the Capitol, interfering with Congress, et cetera, it's... Um, it's easier to bring federal charges in that attack than it was over the summer. So a lot of those state and local prosecutions that you're referring to from over the summer have had our Joint Terrorism Task Force working closely with Dr. our Ray, state I've local I've got five partners. seconds yeah. left, but I just want to mention uh, there were attacks on federal facilities and cities across the United States. Yes, and, and so that's the other piece of it, right? We have lots of investigations, lots of federal investigations. Uh, like I mentioned, I think, in my opening remarks, I think Essentially, all of our 56 field offices have been investigating activity there, and we are looking for things that are, of course, harder to drill into, but we're looking for things like funding, like logistics, like coordination. Um, and so the, a lot of these gets down to questions of how readily available is the evidence, how clear is the federal jurisdiction. But when we have charges that we can bring federally, we're all in. We're all in. I mean, you know, some of these are offenses over the summer where people have brought, you know, thrown Molotov cocktails. Uh, in some cases, we were able to bring federal charges related to that. Uh, in some cases, there's an assault on a federal officer, and we're able to bring assault on federal officer charges. So we're looking for those types of offenses, but we're also looking at the kind of the more systematic type of issue. Again, funding, logistics, coordination, all that stuff. Um, and a lot of this boils down to the less glamorous you, a spade work that you would recognize from the investigative activity. You, sometimes you, the evidence is readily available, sometimes it's harder to get at. But we're, yeah, we're absolutely, yeah. we have one standard. I don't care whether you're upset at our criminal justice system or upset at our election system. Violence, assault on federal law the enforcement, destruction uh, of property is not the way to do it. That's our position. The, one gen the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Jeffries. Uh, thank you, Chairman Nadler. Thank you. Director Ray, for your presence and your service to this country. The dramatic uh, rise in anti-Semitic and anti-Asian violence throughout this country is unacceptable, unconscionable, and un-American. So let me begin 
uh, Director Ray, by just urging you and the FBI to dedicate all necessary resources to deal with and address this scourge. Uh, Director Ray, violent white supremacy is the most persistent and lethal threat to the American homeland, correct? We, well, the way we look at it, we've categorized it, I think we're saying the same thing, but just to be clear, we have elevated racially motivated violent extremism, the vast majority of which is motivated by uh, uh, advocacy on behalf of white superiority as uh, at our highest threat priority level. Uh, that's commensurate with ISIS. And it is certainly true that over the last few years, the most lethal attacks here in the homeland uh, have been by individuals of that racially motivated violent extremist uh, category, specifically those advocating for the superiority of the white race. Right, otherwise known as white supremacists. Uh, so the largest group, just to clarify, of racially motivated violent extremists are white supremacist organizations, is that right? Well, I wouldn't say organizations, but individuals. The largest well, portion of the largest portion of, of domestic terrorist investigations that we have, and yeah. uh, and arrests or investigations of the racially well, motivated. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, let me ask you about organizations. The Oath Keepers are a white supremacist organization. True. Uh, I'm not sure that I can characterize their ideology. I would say that we have charged a number of individuals related to specific terrorist activity or violent activity, maybe is a better way of putting it, who self-identify with the Oath Keepers. And I think some of those individuals are ones that we would put in this racially motivated violent extremist category. Uh, we also have a number of such investigations of individuals who self-identify with the Proud Boys uh, in a similar vein. But again, in each of those instances, we're not charging them for their membership in Oath Keepers or Proud Boys. We're charging them Understood. based on their, their violent criminal activity. I, I understood. The FBI respects the First Amendment. So do we in Congress. And we, we can agree on that. Uh, you anticipated my next question. The Oath Keepers clearly are a white supremacist organization. That's my observation, not yours. Uh, but happy to have you join me in that characterization. Would you say that the neo-Nazis are a white supremacist organization? Well, I certainly, th when I use the term neo-Nazis, I think of them as people who are advocating for white supremacy. That's at least the way I think of that term. Okay, I'm wondering why is the FBI generally reluctant to use the term violent white supremacy? I don't, I mean, I think we use the term racially motivated violent extremism partly because we're trying to make clear to our people and everyone who's involved that our focus, that doesn't mean everybody else's focus, but our focus is on the violence. And so part of the reason we changed some of our nomenclature was to make especially sure that what's important to us, and it gets back to this idea that we have one standard, it doesn't matter what your motivation is or how abhorrent or despicable your motivation is, what we have to be focused on is the violence. I understand that uh, the violence is largely being driven by uh, white supremacy as an ideology. If you don't name the problem and claim the problem, it seems to me that it's hard to tame the problem. That's why I'm raising uh, this particular uh, issue. In terms of domestic terrorism, uh, I think you've testified in the past that this is uh, a growing problem that we've experienced in America, correct? Domestic terrorism? Absolutely. That's correct. Yes. And I would argue that it is actually a problem that has been with us uh, for centuries. We know that the KKK was founded in 1865. That's a terrorist organization. Uh, we know that the lynchings that took place in the 1800s and the 1900s were acts of domestic terror. The murder, the brutal killing of Emmett Till uh, in 1955, that was an act of domestic terror. The bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, which took place in 1963. That was an act of domestic terror, killing four beautiful black little girls. This most recent January 6th instance, the attack on the Capitol that resulted in death and mayhem was an act of domestic terror. And the through line through all of those instances is white supremacy. I hope that the FBI 
will use all of its resources to tackle this persistent problem. I yield back. The chair recognizes Ms. Sparks for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, thank you, Director Ray. Um, I just wanted to follow up on, uh, on some questions that my um, colleagues from California brought up uh, related to the FISC opinion and the use of Section 702. Uh, interestingly enough, I also uh, had a letter with my colleague from uh, Congressman Ted Lu uh, from California. So there is some common ground between California and Indiana on some issues. But um, it, it's, uh, and I, res I appreciate that you, your um, assistant director sent in the response uh, last night and on a few other letters. Uh, but one thing that he didn't respond, and we also request a briefing, and I think my con congresswoman from California did too, would we be able to get a briefing by the end of this fiscal year? Briefing on what we're doing to respond to the questions from the FISC yeah. opinion? Yes, that and also on your internal audit initiatives. Uh, sure, we were happy to provide a briefing, but okay. certainly before Thank the you end so of much. Because as you know, this, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978 was uh, legislated by Congress to really address unlawful executive branch surveillance of U.S. citizens. And 2008 law created some loopholes, which given exemptions for surveillance of non U.S. citizens on foreign soil. And as you know, it's been a decade application was very rough in 2018 when Congress renewed this legislation that explicitly required documented all of the instances when it was violated. And if you know the, uh, the court also, the FISC uh, also uh, in the report in 2000, FISA court in the 2018 opinion found that the FBI procedure were in violation of the Fourth Amendment and due process and you instill in all these new procedures and everything else. And in 2020 report, pretty much the court had still significant concerns with FBI implementations. Violations were more pervasive than previously believed. That FBI never applied to the FISC for an order, lack of written justification for a all queries is particularly concerning technical violation unaddressed for nearly a year. Default rules architectures are a lot of different concerns, but in their opinion, court pretty much said there is, uh, we are concerned about the apparent widespread violation, but we don't have an evidence due to a lack of, due to the pandemic, we couldn't do this really audit. So this, due to the absence of evidence to the contrary, court is willing to certify this process. Do you know, I used to be big for auditing. If a PCIB would come to my engagement and they say, okay, you know what? Um, we audited this engagement, there is no evidence, nothing is documented, but generally, since we didn't find, nothing was documented, no evidence provided, it's okay that you said that this is audit statements, is material respect, is, seems to be fair, and, and not materially misstated. I know that you've mentioned that one of your internal audit partners is big for auditor, and I'm sure he will tell you I would be fired if PCOB would come to, you know, <laughs> to my audit and audit, inspect my audit, because ultimately whatever not documented is not done. So do you believe that federal agency should be also held at the same standard as we hold private entities? It's not about the law. Do you believe it should hold it to the same standard? Well, the, the whole... Can you hear me? Yeah. Sure. The whole the whole question about how auditing should be done is, of course, as as you alluded to, uh, a dense one. The internal auditor that we hired, the right. big four. But I'm talking like external because it's internal audit, and I have to disagree in your statement when you said to, uh, to Congressman Issa, "What is audit done for?" Maybe your internal audits are done to find errors. Your external certification done by FISA court is actually to provide an opinion that in material respects, you follow the law, not find an error. As an auditor, you don't want to find errors. You know, that is not the goal for the auditor to find. So do you believe, since you, for 2021, since it's been already a decade, you and your internal controls director would be able to attest that you, you have all this detective preventative control, you've done all these different things, and now at this point, you can actually say that you attest that and provide evidence that in material respect, you follow the law, and if you don't follow, what in the error rate you, ex you know, you're accepting to be able to say, I violated Fourth Amendment right for how many citizens it's acceptable to violate it? 
Would you be able to attest that for your 2021 with all of the new procedures and provide for FISA court when they do new report, this evidence? So maybe it'd be better for me to be able to explain a little bit more about our audit program, and it could be that some of this can be better addressed through the briefing we're talking about uh, standing up for you. But to be clear, the individual we brought in is here to stand up an office of internal audit and to be able to do But as an executive in the office, you are responsible for the office. As the CEO of the company, you're responsible for the office. You're responsible to follow the law as it's written. So would you be able to provide this time and evidence that we don't go another decade because you have authorization in a few years? provide this evidence and say, yes, no. we can provide evidence. We don't violate the rights of U.S. citizens. The gentlelady's time has expired, but you can answer the question. I, I think it would be best. This is a complicated topic. There's a lot that I have to say on it, but it would be probably better addressed through the briefing. That, uh, okay. That I'll look forward to it. Thank you. You'll back. Thank you. The chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island. Thank you. Uh, Director Ray, for your service to our country, and thank you to the men and women of the FBI. Uh, gun violence is an epidemic in our country. Uh, in my home state of Rhode Island last month, a 31-year-old man was shot at a park while playing with his son. A teenage woman was killed while sitting in a car. A 20-year-old man was shot to death outside of his home. And the same thing is happening in cities all across America. And there's no question that this problem has gotten worse during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in 2020, Rhode Island saw a significant increase in gun sales. And during that same time, we saw an 87% increase in gun-related deaths. And that trend has continued into 2021. And so uh, I hope that uh, you can shed some light on what the FBI can do and how Congress can support the agency to fight uh, an epidemic that will claim 40,000 American lives this year. And so specifically, as I discussed, gun rails skyrocketed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Nearly 23 million firearms were purchased nationwide in 2020, a 64% increase. And for each of these sales, a background check is required, putting tremendous pressure on our background check system. And in fact, in March of last year, the start of the pandemic, federal background checks hit a 1 million in a week uh, mark. And so what does that increase in gun sales mean for the background check system and for public safety and particularly uh, with respect to your ability to complete a background check within three days as uh, required by the statute. So, uh, Congressman, I appreciate the question for, uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is our folks at NICS, the background check systems, uh, have worked incredibly hard this past year in particular, right through the teeth of the pandemic, and had to be very creative in terms of how we kept people socially distanced, rotating shifts, et cetera, we lived in fear that we would suddenly lose the ability to be able to continue to process the checks because we could potentially wipe out in terms of having to quarantine an entire room full of cubicles of people. Um, we Director, we processed question, last year 40. Be, yeah, I, my, my question, I guess, is would additional resources be helpful in order to keep up with this pace so that we don't have the three-day period passing before the background check can be completed? Absolutely. We, we have been had to, having to do overtime. We've been having to pull people from other key missions to staff it. We did. I am very proud of the fact that even though we did a record, a record, you used 23 million. Uh, my information is that we processed 40 million firearms background checks last year, last year and that we were able to complete about 96 percent of those within the three days despite that record despite the pandemic. Thank you, Director. So in 2018, the Center for American Progress and according to FBI data as well, almost 4,000 prohibited purchasers were able to get a gun because the background check for their sale was not completed within three days. This is the loophole that allowed the Charleston shooter who legally should have never been allowed to purchase a firearm to buy a gun and use it to murder nine worshipers in a church. So my question is, how is the FBI supporting the ATF's recovery of firearms found to be transferred to a prohibited purchaser? Are you giving specific instructions nationwide to FT office, ATF offices on how to do this? Uh, are those practices being formalized? Because my experience is they're supposed to be recovered by ATF, but it doesn't seem like that happens. This is individuals who got a gun from a gun store who are legally prohibited from owning it. 
And I've actually introduced a bill, the unlawful gun buyer alert, that would require local law enforcement be notified if firearms are delivered to a prohibited purchaser and wonder whether you think that would also be helpful in making jurisdictions aware when someone has illegally purchased a gun. But I'm really interested to know what you're doing with your field offices at ATF and this recovery and how we can at least take on this issue of people getting guns from a gun store who don't pass a background check. I think it might be better for me to offer to have my staff provide you more information about the details of how we work with ATF. They have a very, very tough job, as you alluded to, in recovering the guns that uh, are, are sold to people who are prohibited by law from having them. Can you do a briefing on that, Director, because I'm very, that'd be very helpful. To, We'd be, uh, be happy to set up a briefing on that subject. And my last question, Director, is uh, since September 11th, uh, the FBI has provided tens of millions of dollars of counterterrorism training and resources to state and local uh, law enforcement agencies. How is the FBI reallocating this support to state and local partners to address the rise of white supremacists and anti-government groups? And is the Bureau also giving guidance to the Joint Terrorism Task Force to address white supremacist extremism? So a couple of things there. One is we absolutely are providing domestic terrorism training um, to state and local partners. And we've actually recently been providing some of our more advanced training to the state and local officers of whom there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds who are task force officers on our joint terrorism task forces. As to the prioritization of the joint terrorism task forces on domestic terrorism and specifically racially motivated violent extremism, when I elevated that to a, our highest priority level uh, back in summer of 2019, the effect of that was to make sure that not only that all 56 field offices are collecting intelligence and disseminating it on that subject, but also to make sure that all 200 plus joint terrorism task forces and the 4,500 or 5,000, whatever it is, uh, investigators that are on them have domestic terrorism and specifically that part of domestic terrorism squarely within their sights. And you, you the, 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 gentleman is, the gentleman's time, the gentleman, the gentleman's time has expired. Um, uh, Mr. Jordan. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, why did you take their copy of the Constitution? I'm sorry, take copy of the, who's, the couple, who's the couple in uh, The couple in Alaska that turned out to be the wrong couple, you, you kicked in their door, you held them at gunpoint, handcuffed them, interrogated them for four hours, took their phone, you took their laptop, and you took a copy of their pocket-sized constitution. Why did you take the constitution? Well, Congressman, as you know, I can't discuss a specific investigation. I'm not sure whether your characterization is accurate or not, but I, I can't provide it specific why information about the, a pending been investigation. In the, been reported in the press, our staff has actually talked to these individuals. That's what, the, I mean, it's, they, they tell us this is exactly what happened. I'm just curious, you know, I see what you'd maybe, you had the wrong couple, but if you take their phone, their laptop, I'm just curious why you take the Constitution. Again, I can't comment on a specific investigation and what the Have you personally talked to the Hoopers? Have I talked to whom? Have you talked to this couple in Alaska? Again, the, 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 the couple who had their door kicked in, damage to their door, the FBI has now repaired their door, uh, held a gunpoint, handcuffed, and interrogated for four hours. Have you talked to him personally? Uh, no, I have not. If you find out it's really, I mean, I, I think it's obvious to, it, based on what we've discovered that this was the wrong couple, that these weren't people who did anything wrong. Uh, if you find out they are, will you call them? Uh, I'd have to look at the circumstances of what happened, but it's an ongoing investigation. That's all I can really say on it at this, at this time. If it turns out you, you've sent their phone back to them, the laptop back to them, if it turns out that they are the wrong couple, as again, as I, I think that is, is pretty obvious, um, what happens to the data on the phone that you have? Can you, I'm sorry, can you explain a little bit more what you're asking? You keep a record, like you, you've returned the phone to them, but the data on the phone, do you have like copies of their text messages, emails, anything on their phone? Did you keep all that? Um, I well, when we return people's information, my impression is that we don't keep that information, but it depends on the circumstances of the investigation. It's an innocent couple. You, you, your impression is you're not going to keep information? Well, again, I can't discuss a specific investigation. If, I, if you would like to get more information about how it works when we return, more generally, our policies and practices, when we return information, I'm happy to see we can provide that information to you separately. Well, you would think if, it's, if, it's, if they're not 
if they're innocent, they're not guilty, and you've got information on them, you would, you would get rid of that information. You wouldn't, the FBI wouldn't keep it. I, and I'm not trying to. But again, in light of what we've found out with about FISA, maybe not. I'm not, I'm, I honestly, I'm really not trying to quibble with you here. The only reason I'm providing what sounds like a confusing answer is because each case is different, depends on the circumstances as to how you got the information, what the circumstances were. We certainly have instances where we purge information that we have. I know that happens. We have other instances where we may be investigating something and the information is kept. But again, it depends on the circumstances of the whole network. Do you know, do you know how this couple was identified? I mean, you, you look on your uh, Twitter site, the, the, the posted tweet is a, is a crowdsourcing. Can you help us find these individuals? You got pictures of the individuals. This is relative to January 6th. Um, were, were, was this couple in Alaska found through the crowdsourcing, that, 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 that technique? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that sitting here right now. And again, I want to be careful not to discuss a specific investigation. I will say that more generally, in related to January 6th, uh, part of the purpose of, of uh, putting out information for the public is for the public to identify people. Right. We know people to identify. You're doing, are you doing that as well for, for the rioters, the, the, the people in the Antifa in Portland? You're doing that as well them? Yes, okay, absolutely. You, do you, uh, is, it a, is a habit of the FBI to take constitutions from people that you're interrogating? I don't know if it's a habit to pursue any particular document. Just found, we, I just we, found that we just seized the evidence that's relevant to what's in the affidavit that we search warrant affidavit that we presented to the judge who signed off on it. Did you sign off on the uh, on the raid on Mayor Giuliani's apartment? Again, I'm not going to discuss any specific investigation. I don't normally sign off on specific operational activity as FBI director. Because I'm going to ask, I asked, did you sign off on this specific FBI activity where the president's personal lawyer's apartment in Manhattan was raided? And again, I'm not going to discuss any specific investigation. The, um, are you aware of any leaks by the FBI or the Department of Justice about an investigation of Postmaster General DeJoy? I'm aware of news coverage uh, about an investigation related to that individual, but I'm not aware of leaks you from been people on inside anything? the FBI. You haven't been briefed on anything relative to the FBI or the Justice Department relating to that leak of an investigation of the postmaster. Gentlemen, his time has expired. The witness may answer the question. I can't discuss a specific investigation. Uh, I am aware of the news coverage about the investigation you're referring to, and I'm just going to have to leave it at that here. Thank you, Director. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Swalwell. Director, the plain definition of an insurrection is violent uprising against government. On January 6, an officer died. A couple days later, two died, death by suicide. Hundreds were injured that day. Uh, an eye was lost, fingers were lost. Officers suffered a heart attack. The counting of the Electoral College was suspended for approximately six hours. Members of Congress retreated to a secure location was January 6th an insurrection? Well, Congressman, I certainly understand uh, why you would describe it that way. In my role as FBI director, because that's a term that has legal meaning, I really have to be careful about using words like that uh, and not getting ahead of both prosecutors and judges uh, who have very strong opinions on what kind of public commentary, as you may remember from your past life, uh, I can engage in. So I certainly understand why you're asking the question. Uh, given the circumstances both you described um, and a lot of the other details surrounding the attack. We are treating it uh, as a, an act of domestic terrorism and investigating it through our Joint Terrorism Task Force. Uh, and uh, we are, as you know, now uh, in the midst of bringing any number of conspiracy charges, uh, which are particularly serious. And, but this is a very ongoing investigation, and there's a lot more to come, and I would expect to see more charges, uh, some of them may be more serious charges. Director, we're all grateful when we saw the FBI's SWAT team and its forensics team on the floor uh, after the attack. But before the attack, uh, you told the Intel Committee that you were looking for and through social media as a key part of investigations and that you would get tips from social media companies Prior to January 6th, did the FBI receive any tips from social media companies about threats to the Capitol? Well, we've had so much information now, I'm, I'm reluctant to sort of answer 
uh, any question about the word any, <laughs> especially because we're now, you know, 500 arrests into an investigation and after the fact. Um, certainly we were aware of online chatter uh, about the potential for violence, but I'm not aware that we had any um, intelligence indicating that hundreds of individuals were going to storm the Capitol itself, um, to my knowledge. Do you believe the Bureau has the ability to monitor publicly available social media or open source uh, intelligence collection? Let me just repeat the question. I want to be sure I answer it. Yeah. Carefully. Do you have the authority and ability to monitor open source intelligence collection? So, for example, uh, any website, chat room, where you know consistently groups there are posting about threats, whether it's the Capitol, whether it's the law enforcement, do you have the ability and, and can you monitor open source? So uh, the answer to that, unfortunately, like so many things, is complicated. Uh, there are attorney general guidelines as implemented through the so-called DIOG that have been around for many, many years now that govern what we can and cannot do in the space, all of which are geared towards protecting the First Amendment. Um, with proper predication and an authorized purpose, there are a lot of things we can do on social media. But what we're not allowed to do is just sit and monitor social media and look at one person's posts, just looking to see if maybe something would happen just in case. That we're not allowed to do. Well, in the public realm, uh, we are learning that this attack on the Capitol was not a 500-year storm. In fact, as we speak right now, there's a count going on in Arizona related to the 2020 election where claims are being made that the outcome was fraudulent. The former president uh, is telling people uh, that he plans to be reinstated in August, and so you can see that uh, when you have those statements, that count, social media may be a place to look as far as intentions to try and reinstate the president. Knowing that a storm may be coming, uh, Director, what can we do uh, to make sure that an attack like that does not happen again? So uh, what we can do, uh, and we benefit very much from, is getting tips and leads about things that are on social media from everything from social media companies themselves uh, to members of the public. Uh, you often hear the expression that DHS coined of if you see something, say something. And most people imagine when they hear that, you know, the unattended backpack in a Greyhound bus terminal or something. And obviously, we want people to say something then too. Well, what we're trying to communicate is if you see something that looks like criminal activity and threat of violence say something, including if you see something on social media, we need you to say something. And that's what our TIP center uh, is, is partly there for. But you can contact law enforcement, state and local law enforcement. And has, sure has your somebody judgment, gets the, the committees, uh, the, the, the director, has your judgment time? changed that there was, not, there was not widespread fraud in the 2020 election? Uh, as former Attorney General Barr and former Acting Attorney General Rosen have both said, we just we looked, but we didn't see evidence uh, of fraud sufficient to change the outcome uh, of the presidential election. Thank you, Director. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, at this time, the uh, committee will stand in recess for about half an hour. We will resume promptly at 1 p.m.
put these parameters in place, here's our data from 17, 18, and 18, 19, where we are with ELA math and science. Just by putting these parameters in place, we will begin to move the needle in the right direction, but we know that's not enough. We're gonna to continue to train, we're gonna to continue to provide opportunity, and we're gonna to continue to learn from each other. With that, Chair Tuck, I'll entertain any questions. Okay, before we go to the board for questions, we got one public speaker. Um, okay, I don't see him. Okay. I don't see him. See if he's still here. Dr. Jeff.
Committee will come back. Committee will come back to order. Mr. Liu. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Biggs. Okay, let's try again, Mr. Mr. Roy. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chairman. Can the Chairman hear me? Yes. I appreciate that. Uh, Director Ray, I uh, appreciate your service, appreciate you being here today. Uh, last month, uh, I had a letter that uh, my colleague Thomas Massey and I sent to the Department of Justice requesting further information uh, on prosecutions of individuals who were present at the Capitol on January 6th. Now, earlier you talked about there being over 500 um, uh, investigations, arrests, or, or prosecutions that might be underway. And you categorize them in three categories, those who had peaceably assembled, those who maybe crossed some lines they shouldn't have, uh, and then those who had engaged in violence, obviously, um, and damaging property and harming police. Those are my words, but roughly that. Um, my concern is making sure that those who are there uh, exercising their First Amendment rights are not being swept up into investigations or being wrongfully arrested. I have constituents who are concerned. Will you commit to join personally along with the people necessary to bring in from the FBI to have a briefing for all members of Congress, not just this committee, uh, on this question of the arrest, the nature of the arrests, and, and how that investigation is going? Well, uh, Congressman, I appreciate the question. First, just I want to clarify one thing based on what you just summarized. We are not conducting investigations, uh, to my knowledge, certainly, of peaceful protesters and certainly not arresting people for peaceful protests. So when I gave those three groups, I wasn't referring to three types of investigations we have but rather of the three well, types of people who were present in that, the area. That's fine. Yeah, and yeah. No, I, I, understand, I understand that clarification, but I mean, as a former federal prosecutor, I get it. But w will you commit to a briefing along those lines? I, I, I'm happy to see what kind of briefing we could provide to the committee. Obviously, as I alluded in some of the response to some of the earlier questions, because we have now something like 500 cases pending in yep. front of different very particular federal judges, I really have to be careful about what I can commit I to share. Understand that, but a briefing for members of Congress on what happened on January 6th so we can understand the investigations of citizens, both for those of us who want to ensure people have the, the law fully enforced to engage in activities they should have done, as well as citizens who maybe might be being wrongfully targeted. I think we ought to have that briefing. Um, I want to turn my attention to the border. Um, does the United States have operational control of our southern border? I'm not sure I'm really the right person to address that. I think that's a better question for the Department of Homeland Security. But as the director of the FBI and someone keenly aware of the illegal and dangerous activities going on with cartels along our border, would you say that the United States has operational control of our southern border? Well, I hesitate to use words like operational control. What I would say is that the, the border security issues are of great concern, uh, and they span everything from violent crime associated with the border, drug trafficking associated with the border, human trafficking associated yep. with the border, et cetera. Yeah. Along those, along those lines, Rick, I'm sorry, you know our time's limited. I hate interrupting, but are you aware that we've had over 700,000 apprehensions since January 1? I don't have the exact number, but I know there are quite a few, to put it mildly. Does it sound right that maybe 300,000 gotaways and releases have occurred, according to sources on the ground? Are you aware that, I'm going to ask a series of questions, you can kind of answer them in, in mass. Are you aware that through May, the fentanyl numbers for 2021 are 7,400 pounds intercepted at the, at the border compared to 4,700 pounds for all of 2020? Do you agree that fentanyl is one of the most dangerous drugs in the world? And do you agree that, um, that it is infiltrating our communities and our schools and that synthetic drugs, including fentanyl, are by far the fastest part of the opioid epidemic and that we're at unprecedented overdose, overdose deaths in the United States at 91,000, according to the CDC, uh, from October 19 to October 20. Does, does that all sound uh, consistent with what you know about what's going on with our drug communities and our border situation? Well, I, I, given your past background, you, you will understand when I refer to what you just asked as a compound question. But suffice, yeah. to say, suffice to say that I totally agree that the drug issues related to the border are extremely significant, that fentanyl, uh, the problem with fentanyl, fentanyl coming into this country from elsewhere, including from the southwest border, um, is uh, something that I think can fairly be described as an epidemic. Uh, and I, yeah. Two last questions. 
Uh, there's also significant problems in human trafficking, upward to 300,000 people being trafficked in our country, 20,000 being brought into our country every year, even when we don't have the massive numbers we have right now. The cartel Jalisco New Generation, Operation Mosaitas, have recently taken over control of Tamaulipas. They're driving fentanyl. We now have had an 800 percent increase in Texas of fentanyl seizures. That is a massive number because it's coming into Texas. So my question for you, and I'll close because I'm out of time. My question is, is it what is the FBI doing? Have they provided assets directly to CBP to help work to stop the dangerous reach of cartels, fentanyl, human trafficking into Texas the, and the rest of our country? The gentleman's time has expired. The witness may answer the question. Uh, I'll provide a brief answer, and then maybe we can supply some more information after the fact. So certainly, uh, we are very actively engaged with CBP through across all of our border uh, divisions, um, Texas, all the way over to California. Um, and we are working it together with Human Trafficking Task Forces, Safe Streets and Gangs Task Forces, OCDF Strike Forces. We even have tried to contribute by, uh, on the other side of the border, down with our league at working closely on human trafficking and special interest alien issues. And of course, we also have something that a lot of people don't realize we do. Uh, we have so-called TAGs, or transnational anti-gang task forces, even all the way down in the Northern Triangle, where we're trying to work with vetted police officers from those countries to try to prevent, at the source, some of the threat from MS-13 and others uh, going up to the United States. So happy to provide some more detailed information uh, in separately. Gentlemen, Thank you, Mr. Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield gen the gentleman yields back, Mr. Liu. Thank you, Chairman Nadler, and thank you, Director Ray, for your lengthy public service and to all their personnel at the FBI for keeping Americans safe. Earlier at this hearing, it was brought up that COVID-19 uh, could be a bioweapon. So before I ask you any questions, I just want to make a public service announcement. If you're watching this and you believe COVID-19 is a bioweapon, you can protect yourself. Go get vaccinated. If you are fully vaccinated, then COVID-19 largely cannot harm you. Please consult your doctor if you have any questions. So, Director Ray, I'd like to follow up on the question by Congress Members Zoe Lofgren, uh, Congress Member Issa, as well as Congresswoman Sparks on Section 702 of FISA and the database. As Congresswoman Sparks mentioned, we wrote a letter to you about how the FBI got access to private information of Americans without a warrant from this database. I appreciate your response back where you implement a number of procedures to mitigate this from happening in the future. What I'd like to know is if in the future the FBI either accidentally or intentionally gets this information from the foreign surveillance database without a warrant, do you segment that information so that if it's ever used in a court of law, uh, the defendant can challenge it and, and challenge how it may have influenced your investigation? Um, I think the answer I think the answer is yes, but I prefer to make sure that I have people follow up with you to make sure that we're giving you the technically precise answer to that question. I appreciate that you could do that. Thank you. Uh, my next question goes to January 6th insurrection and what it was based on. I appreciate that you earlier had stated that you investigated alleged voter fraud, and you could not find any fraud sufficient to overturn the results of the election. In these five or so arrests of the individuals that attacked our Capitol, it's true, isn't it, that a number of them went to the Capitol to stop the Electoral College from being certified based on the big lie that the election was stolen. In other words, they were there not because they were upset about corporate tax rates, but because they believe the election was stolen. Is that correct? Well, certainly uh, a, some portion of the individuals that we arrested, uh, have arrested so far, were individuals whose intention was to interfere with or obstruct the operation of, um, of Congress's constitutional responsibilities here. And our constitutional responsibility on that day on January 6th was to at the election results in the Electoral College, correct? Yes. Yes. 
hackers have done. It seems like in the 21st century that these cyber attacks are only going to increase. Uh, would you agree, Director Ray, that we're likely going to see an increase in cyber attack against both the public and private sector? Uh, yes, we think the cyber threat is increasing uh, almost exponentially. Uh, I mean, ransomware alone, the total volume of amounts paid uh, in ransomware, I think, has tripled over the last year. We're investigating, I think, 100 different ransomware variants, and each one of those 100 has dozens, if not hundreds, of victims. And that's just ransomware. That's just ransomware. We obviously are investigating scores and scores and scores of nation-state intrusions and other kinds of cyber criminal attacks. So the scale of this uh, is something that I don't think this country's ever really ever seen anything quite like it, and it's going to get much worse. private sector. Uh, that's why I've introduced legislation to provide incentives for people to go into the cybersecurity field. We're simply going to need more of these cyber workers in order to protect uh, Americans in the future. Now, some of these hacking groups appear to uh, either be in Russia or operate with either um, their complicity of Russia or directly at the behest of Russia. Uh, would you uh, agree that there is some state action involvement in uh, some of these hacker groups? Well, it, of course, varies from intrusion to intrusion. We know the Russians have a very active, clearly state-sponsored uh, cyber campaign, including things like the uh, solar winds intrusion, which we have now publicly attributed to the SVR. Uh, in the past, there have been um, other indictments where we've brought against other members of the Russian intelligence services. Separate from that, there are, of course, cyber criminal a actors, any number of whom operate um, quite, a, quite a number of whom operate on Russian soil. The, the degree of nexus between those cyber criminals and the Russian government is not something I can discuss in an open hearing. But I will say that the, um, the most recent actors, the so-called uh, dark side actors involved in the colonial pipeline attack, uh, are individuals who, um, perhaps not coincidentally, specifically target English-speaking victims. The gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Bishop. Mr. Biggs. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thanks, Director Ray, for being here. Um, I'm going to read a quote from a co recent commentator. Quote, we can continue playing compliance whack-a-mole, but at this point it's reasonable to ask whether this sort of large-scale collection on a general warrant model is inherently prone to these problems in a way that resists robust and timely oversight. We've seen this movie before. The court wags its finger at systemic noncompliance by ultimately, but ultimately decides to give the FBI yet another chance, close quote. Of course, this commentator is referring to the uh, opinion from the Fisk Court, that which came out in November, which was just recently released uh, it, uh, about April 20th, I believe, April 21st. Um, and in that uh, opinion, the judge said, while the court is concerned about the apparent widespread violation, it lacks sufficient information at this time to assess the adequacy of FBI system changes and training. And so, so um, Congressman, the ranking member, Jim Jordan, and, and myself wrote to you on May 4th and we had we presented three questions to you. The first one was, please explain why almost a year after the OIG's report about FISA abuses, the FISC found the FBI to still be abusing its warrantless surveillance authority under Section 702. And I reason, and, and I think we brought that up because in one example, you had at least 40 uh, individuals surveilled um, who had nothing to do with foreign intelligence whatsoever, uh, and that was a finding. The second question was, please provide a detailed accounting of every instance since December 2019 in which the FBI has queried, accessed, otherwise used information obtained pursuant to Section 702 for purposes unrelated to national security. And the third question was, please explain what actions you have taken in the wake of the FISC November 2020 memo opinion in order to prevent, uh, and order to prevent the FBI from using its Section 702 authorities to surveil, investigate, or otherwise examine U.S. citizens. So we sent that on May 4th. And then uh, over a month after that last night, we received the response. It wasn't from you, it was from your deputy, uh, or your, uh, your assistant director, excuse me. 
And that, that letter was primarily focused on question three, which I get. And, and you've mentioned that several times today, and I appreciate the efforts that you're trying to, to, to make to, to uh, clean this up or at least uh, provide some kind of effort to, to prevent this, the kind of systemic uh, abuses that we've seen in the past. But Director Ray, I think it's imperative that we understand um, the answers to uh, questions one and two, which I, which I reiterated to you. And you don't have time to answer them all here. It, it, it would be better if we could have a dialogue for sure. But um, what I wanna know is, can you provide us a detailed accounting of every instance since December 19, in which the FBI's queried, accessed, or otherwise used information obtained by 702 for purposes unrelated to national security? I can look and see if there's more information we can provide you, perhaps uh, in a classified setting. Uh, I will say that uh, the summary uh, that you just gave, it's important, I think, for people not to confuse two different issues. The Inspector General's 2019 report has to do with surveillance. Right. And we've talked about that at great length, including in a prior hearing in front yes. of this committee. The 702, the, the FISC opinion, has to do with querying, which is running searches in a database. There's nothing having to do with surveillance. All that is lawfully collected information. So it has nothing to do with surveillance or anything like that. That does not mean that we don't consider the findings in the Fisk opinion incredibly important, which is why I'm putting in place which all is, these measures. Which is, the, yeah. the, the, the judge found them so troubling that he required now, and I was gonna ask you about this, he requires you to provide a report every quarter about um, minimization, uh, querying, your efforts there. Have you provided the first quarter's report to the FISC? I'd have to check. I know that we deal with the FISC fairly regularly um, and provide all sorts of reports to them. Uh, it's important to note that the court uh, approved our procedures, our minimization procedures, our collection procedures, our querying procedures, did not find misconduct. Didn't find misconduct, right. but, but it, it was still, it found widespread um, improper. I'm gonna use the word improprieties, but he was very concerned about widespread uh, improprieties, and he, that's why he wants the report. He wanted it going forward, is to find out what you guys are doing. So I want to know if, if Congress is gonna get a copy of that report. The gentleman's well. time has expired. The witness may answer the question. I'm happy to see what information we can provide you. The court, though, does not speak in terms of improprieties, and I think the court knows how to use that term when that's what it thinks it's found. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Rankin, Raskin rather. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Director Ray. Thank you for your service, and thanks also for reminding us that if we see something, we should say something. And uh, uh, I see Donald Trump telling his followers that he is about to be reinstated as President of the United States in August. So I wanted to make sure I said something so uh, the FBI can be on top of that situation given that he's incited violence against the government before. But I wonder if you can um, help us understand what the FBI did on June 1st, 2020 versus what it did on January 6th, 2021. Um, on June 1st, 2020, we saw a full-blown government assault on hundreds of Americans who had peacefully assembled in Lafayette Square in the nation's capital to speak and petition government for redress of grievances relating to the murder of George Floyd. And then America Watch's federal law enforcement in riot gear and on horseback cleared peaceful protesters and reporters uh, firing pepper balls and flash grenades into the crowd. It's been reported that around 2 p.m. on that day, top law enforcement and military officials assembled at the FBI command center, your command center, for a planning meeting in advance of this assault on the civil rights protesters. And so I wanna ask you, who was the senior most FBI official present handling the Bureau's actions on that day? Was that you? If not you, who was it? And what was the FBI's general role and function in the events of June 1st? Well, um, there were a lot of people going in and out of the command post over the course of that day, so I'm not sure I can speak exactly to who was doing what at two o'clock uh, that afternoon uh, about well, a year ago. But, but at, well, but 
it's important to be clear about what we're talking about here. You asked about the FBI's role. So the FBI does not, did not on, on June 1st of 2020 or on January 6th, we don't have the skills, the job responsibility, the training, the equipment, or the responsibility to engage in crowd control, riot control, uh, things of that sort. So we were not engaged in that kind of activity on June 1st or on January 6th. We do have a command post at the Washington field office. Uh, and at some point on uh, the day that you're referring to, at some point, at different points of the day, especially in the evening and at nighttime, uh, I was over there. Um, I was not in Lafayette Square. I was in the uh, Washington Field Office Command Post for a good part of that night. At different parts of the day, other senior executives at the FBI were coming and going. But the, the activity that you're describing is not the FBI's. Uh, you asked about the FBI's role. That was not the FBI's role. But what was the FBI's role? So we had a, a few different things. Uh, one was to provide the, we, I think our folks do a very good job of running command posts that bring different agencies together so that they can all sit shoulder to shoulder and exchange information, let each other know what they're doing, et cetera. So that's one thing we did. Second, uh, we are a, an intelligence agency. So to the extent that we have intelligence to collect, to analyze, and to disseminate, we do that. Third, we have tactical response. So if there is uh, an incident that occurs uh, where there's a crime being committed, we in certain instances have the ability to send you know, a SWAT team to respond, uh, and we sometimes do that. And then last but not least, we investigate um, criminal activity. We are, after all, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, not the Federal Bureau of Security, not the Federal Police. Uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, and so we do that. And so our folks would have been in a variety of ways providing support to our partners uh, using the skill sets that, that we have, uh, which are extensive but not the same as a lot of our federal partners. Okay, so I wonder if you would just translate those four functions that you played um, on June 1st, 2020 to January 6th. Um, did you activate the command post on January 6th? Uh, we, were you operating as an intelligence agency? Was there tactical response? And were you doing investigation on that day? So as a general matter, all four of those same things uh, applied on January 6th as well. We had the command post just like we did back in June. We had the command post stood up at the Washington field office. Uh, we also had, just like we did back in June, a, a national command post stood up at our SIOC at headquarters. Uh, we were collecting, analyzing, and sharing intelligence when we had it. We had SWAT teams at the ready to deploy, and as we all know now, uh, at the appropriate time or at some point in time over the course of the afternoon, uh, we were asked to send our SWAT team, and we did. Um, and, and, were you and we did investigate back to And were you present yourself on January 6th? I was present in one of the command posts in the national, um, the national, uh, command post at headquarters. Um, so yeah, I was in one of the command posts, yes. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, on June 8, ProPublica published an article stating that it, quote, has obtained a vast trove of IRS data on the tax returns of thousands of the nation's wealthiest people covering more than 15 years, close quote. Now, the article went on to disclose detailed return information spanning five years of several ultra-wealthy uh, Democrats who seem to have much, more, much less enthusiasm for taxes in private than they advocate for publicly. But um, Title 26, Section 7213 makes it a federal felony punishable, punishable by fine and up to five years in prison willfully to disclose return information. Uh, that statement and the balance of the article reflect that the commission of tens of thousands of counts of crimes, probably by some IRS employee or some other authorized disclosee of the data or some hacker. Uh, ProPublica reporters and editors also apparently have committed criminal violations under Section 7213A3 by publishing this data. They write that they intended to commit, uh, commit more of that. Uh, in fact, they wrote that they thought about the privacy implications and concluded that they're in effectively above the law. Um, has the FBI made any arrests in connection with that matter? 
I can't comment on any specific the existence or conduct of any specific investigation, but uh, to the extent that I can speak in this kind of setting, I'm not aware of any arrests specifically related to the news coverage that you just described. Have the FBI uh, executed any search warrants or raided any offices or given any tips to CNN about such thing in connection with this matter? Uh, I can't. There's no such activity that I can describe at this time. The FBI has arrested hundreds of people, as you've te described in your testimony, for trespassing, some of them, uh, within days of their offense and put them in solitary confinement, in some cases, for 90 days detention without bail. Why is this particular brazen, massive crime um, deprioritized? You're talking about specifically the leak of, of uh, taxpayer tens of, information. Tens of thousands of taxpayer information. Well, I'm, I don't think we, I'm not suggesting any lack of prioritization. Uh, there is responsibility for uh, activity of IRS employees that in also involves the IRS Inspector General. Uh, and so there may be a difference in the areas of responsibility as compared if you're comparing it to January 6th, where uh, when it comes to acts of domestic terrorism, that's squarely something that we're expected to prioritize, and I think as the committee would want, counterterrorism is the FBI's number one priority. Uh, Director Ray, it, it, have there been any arrests in connection with the New York Times publication last September of the details of Donald Trump's tax information? Uh, I'm not aware of any. Did any uh, criminal charges ever get brought against Lois Lerner? I, I don't know the answer to that sitting here right now. Shifting topics a little, Director Ray, uh, but maybe thematically connected and touched on by Mr. Buck. The FBI has frequently dismissed charges against violent rioters over past months in Portland. Uh, you made reference to that matter some. Um, reportedly, over half of the charges brought have been dismissed. I think the number is about 87, and about a half of those are gone. Uh, on May 28th, the journalist Andy No released a statement and evidence that he was assaulted and beaten. Uh, while covering the latest violent riot by Antifa at that time, he wrote about being pursued as he fled through the city streets and having to beg refuge in a hotel and fleeing into the upper floors to evade being captured and killed by rioters calling for his death. Mr. No has been repeatedly targeted, physically attacked because of his reporting on Antifa violence in Portland and Seattle. Uh, you mentioned earlier Asian Americans being specifically targeted. That includes Mr. No. Members of this committee have written you specifically before I joined this committee this session about prior assaults on Mr. No. Uh, we did it again early this week. There's been no response. In 1961, the Attorney General sent 600 U.S. Marshals to Alabama to protect freedom riders from mobs of violent people who are attacking them. Uh, why is the FBI not living up to its traditions in the enforcement of civil rights and protection of journalists like Mr. No? So uh, first thing I would say is w when you're describing the prosecutions in Portland, to be clear, the FBI is not dismissing any cases. We don't, the decisions to prosecute or dismiss prosecutions are made by the prosecutors, not by the FBI. And so any frustration you might have in that regard um, shouldn't be directed our way. Um, the second, uh, we have prioritized um, investigations of what I would call anarchist violent extremism, uh, in which includes any number of individuals who, who self-identify, say, with Antifa. And in fact, we've had a significant number, significant increase in our number of anarchist violent extremist investigations during my tenure. In fact, we had more anarchist violent extremist arrests last year in 2020 than the prior three years combined. Um, so we are actively pursuing those investigations where we can. Um, it's, a, it's a threat that we take very seriously. Uh, we saw, for example, the first, um, in recent memory, the first lethal anarchist violent extremist attack uh, last year. It was directed by an Antifa identifier who attacked a, a supporter of the other side. Um, and he ultimately, that defendant yeah. ultimately died in a shootout with the, the marshals, as you may know. The gentleman so something we take very seriously. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Chairman, can I uh, make for, a unanimous consent? For technical reasons, the committee will stand in recess for 10 minutes. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. <clears throat>
The committee will come to order. Ms. Jayapal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, thank you for being with us. In April 2020, white supremacists stormed the Michigan State Capitol carrying guns, swastikas, Confederate flags, and a doll representing Governor Whitmer with a noose around its neck. Many of us saw those events as a dress rehearsal for the events of January 6th. Did the FBI consider these events in its preparation and intelligence gathering leading up to January 6th? Well, certainly uh, threats in Michigan were something that were very much uh, on our mind. Among other things, we, as you may know, we investigated and took down a ring of domestic terrorists who were attempting to kidnap Governor Whitmer, the so-called Wolverines. Did you consider the events as they relate to the intelligence that you were seeing relative to January 6th? Uh, it's hard for me to say specifically. Uh, certainly it was something that was of, on our mind, uh, and we baked in all the information we had in the intelligence products that we were putting out over the course of 2020 right on up until December, warning about the potential for domestic violent extremism as it relates to the election, continuing past Election Day itself, continuing through into inauguration. Thank you, Director Ray. It isn't just white supremacists as rioters or insurrectionists that we're concerned about. We're also concerned about the infiltration of the ranks of law enforcement, something that you earlier in this hearing called uh, the internal threat, I believe you said, and you said that you were taking it very seriously. Is that correct? Yes, I, did, I think the phrase I used was the insider threat. Insider yes. threat, thank yes. you. But this isn't a new threat. In fact, 15 years ago in 2006, the FBI Counterterrorism Division released an intelligence assessment on white supremacist infiltration of law enforcement. Then in 2015, the FBI Counterterrorism Division's Policy Directive and Policy Guide warned agents assigned to domestic terrorism cases that the white supremacist groups that they investigate often have, quote, active links to law enforcement officials. And in February of 2020, a confidential intelligence assessment concluded that white supremacists were very likely to seek affiliation with law enforcement to further their ideologies. The report stated that extremists expressed a desire to join the military and law enforcement primarily to obtain trade craft to prepare for and initiate a collapse of society. Director Ray, are you familiar with these three reports? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with those specific reports, but I'm familiar with in general with the theme that they represent, at least as you've described them. In September of 2020, you testified before the House Homeland Security Committee that, quote, racially motivated violent extremists over recent years have been responsible for the most lethal activity in the United States. Now, the 2020 intelligence assessment specifically highlighted the risk of white supremacists joining law enforcement as a way to engage in violence against the U.S. government and certain racial and ethnic groups, which sounds eerily familiar to what we saw on January 6th. To your knowledge, Director Ray, were there law enforcement officers participating in the January 6th attack on the Capitol? Uh, well, there were a whole variety of types of individuals involved in the January 6th. Were there law enforcement the Capitol. officers? I'm about to finish my answer. Um, there were, among the many uh, that we have investigated and arrested, there have been current and especially former members of military and law enforcement. And among the things, uh, which I think is where you're going with your question, uh, that we're doing and have been doing for a while now is working through our Joint Terrorism Task Forces, which often have representatives of both the military and uh, various police departments, law enforcement departments. Uh, so we work closely with them because we're obviously particularly concerned about anybody engaged in domestic terrorism, but especially somebody who might be in a position of trust and responsibility, like a member of law enforcement or military. We have all kinds of engagement with DOD, for example, to try to help Let me keep out. going, because yes. I, I want to get to a couple of specific questions. An independent journalist actually documented at least 45 law enforcement officials in attendance on January 6th that have been publicly reported. And since 2000, law enforcement officials with alleged connections to white supremacist groups or far-right militant activities were exposed in 14 states and hundreds of federal, state, and local law enforcement officials were exposed participating in racist, nativist, and sexist activity. Has the FBI under your leadership, and maybe you were getting to some of these specific points, distributed guidance to state and local law enforcement to assist them in weeding out white supremacist officers? We have engaged with our partners about better 
identifying domestic violence extremism including in particular giving them information about things like symbology tattoos you know that kind of thing things to be sort of on the lookout for that may be indicators of individuals who have mobilized to violent extremism and that is something that we have tried to put out intelligence products and as you mentioned but then others as well uh, and we've done a lot of training and engagement with our partners on some of these topics. My the time has expired, but expired. I, I was hoping that you could provide us with uh, specific, you know, specific steps that you've taken to ensure that we are weeding out these white supremacists within local law enforcement. So perhaps we can get a briefing on some of those specific things you're doing, including collecting statistics uh, on white supremacist affiliation with local law enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, Mr. Tiffany. Director Ray, let me start by highlighting national security concerns. Border Patrol recently arrested two Yemeni men at our border who were on the FBI terror watch list and no-fly list. It's my understanding one of your field offices interviewed them. What was gleaned from that interview or interviews? Um, I can't discuss the you know specific ongoing investigations. Certainly we are concerned about and our Joint Terrorism Task Forces, which I think is what you're driving at, have been lashed up with both CBP at the border um, and to some extent working across the border with our, our LEGAD office in Mexico City uh, with a specific focus on special interest aliens. We're well looking in particular at Yemenis, for example, who may have tried to come in. Um, but I'm not sure there's anything I can share about specific interviews in this kind of setting. Sir. People from countries of particular concern for terrorist activity, you mentioned a few of them, Yemen, uh, Pakistan, Somalia, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and Iran, Iran have been coming. I witnessed it recently during my trip to the Darien Gap in Panama, and I would just say when you talked about, uh, your quote was, um, the source of the problem, which you cited the Northern Triangle, I would go a little further south than that because when I went down to Panama, I saw it down there. And uh, the invasion coming into the United States has exploded as a direct result of President Biden's promise to all comers that he will grant them unobstructed catch and release into the United States. Should Americans have national security concerns with the exponential increase in the worldwide migration occurring as we speak across our southern border? Well, uh, certainly we, we uh, consider uh, security threats at the border to be uh, an opportunity for potential terrorist activity. I, I would not want to leave you with the impression, though, that as we're sitting here that we're tracking any specific credible terrorist threats coming from um, recent uh, individuals crossing the border. Uh, that doesn't give me a lot of assurance when you have tens of thousands of people basically invading our country. The, the, the numbers are staggering. They're coming out every single day. That would not be reassuring to me if I heard that answer as an American. I want to go on to the second issue I'd like to cover, um, our two-tiered justice system. Uh, this is something I hear regularly back home. Time and again, Americans have witnessed justice being carried out in unequal ways. I'll give you a couple of examples. Secretary Hillary Clinton destroying evidence with no consequences. Hunter Biden allegedly lying on his firearms background investigation, no consequences. FBI attorney, former FBI attorney, you probably know, Kevin Kleinsmith getting probation for lying in order to secure renewal applications to the FISA. Uh, and on top of that, we have the amorous couple, Page and Strzok, who I'm sure you know, that were actively trying to um, put their fingers on the scales in an election in 2016. None of these citizens had their homes raided, but they all have one thing in common. They're Democrats. Conversely, your agents have approached conservatives very differently. They've executed dramatic raids on the homes of Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, Rudy Giuliani, and were negligent in the investigation of General Flynn. These citizens all had one thing in common. They're Republicans. I'm leading to a question that happened here in Wisconsin. A man named Bernal Trammell was murdered in broad daylight in Milwaukee last year. His son, sin was he was a Trump supporter. Now earlier when you heard some people listing examples 
of minorities who have been killed here in the United States, which is a terrible thing. They never mention Bernal Trammell, African-American man from Milwaukee, well known for going around his neighborhood, wearing a Trump shirt, showing a Trump sign. No one ever mentions him. It's my understanding his murderer is still at large and the local government has remained quiet on this matter, despite actively encouraging anti-Trump rhetoric and protests all last year. A request was made to launch a federal probe into Mr. Trammell's murder, as it seems to have been politically motivated. Director Ray, have you answered that request and investigated that politically motivated hate crime of Bernal Trammell? I'm not sure that I can address that in this setting. Uh, certainly, I'm happy to follow up with our Milwaukee office to see what the status of that particular issue is. I don't know the circumstances well enough to be able to speak to it. Um, I can assure you that we have one standard, uh, and I've been crystal clear uh, with our folks about that, uh, and that's the way it's gonna be as long as I'm FBI director. I hope- His time has expired, Ms. Demings. Thank you. Now yield back. Gentleman yields back, Ms. Demings. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Director Ray. It's good to see you again. I also want to thank you for uh, protecting the American people and upholding the Constitution. As you well know, what happened on January 6th was shameful, it was disgraceful. And I do believe that as a nation, we failed law enforcement, we failed the American people, we failed the members of Congress, uh, even those who scrambled on that day uh, for their lives to exit the House floor, but now talk as if it wasn't that big of a deal. I also believe we failed the vice president and his staff, and we failed congressional staff. Director Ray, you said you were just as outraged about what happened, uh, but you said the report from the Norfolk uh, FBI office um, was online chatter, that it was raw, unverified information. But you passed it on, and you've made that quite clear several times today, to the Capitol Police. Um, Director Ray, as you know, and, and I certainly do too, the FBI is viewed as a premier, the premier law enforcement agency, and other federal, state, and local agencies look to you and I think uh, rightly so. But it appears to me uh, the FBI dismissed uh, the information. It did not seem there was a sense of urgency. You simply passed it on, and if you did more than that, then I want to hear you talk about that. Um, but let's talk about that information and what resulted. Officer Fanon was dragged and severely beaten. Officers sustained concussions, one officer, lost the tip of his finger. Officers were beaten with baseball bats, poles, and pipes, and two officers committed suicide. I guess that online chatter and unverified raw information was credible after all. Director Ray, there was a failure on that day and I would like to hear from you what role the FBI played in that failure. Well, Congresswoman, happy to take the question. So uh, I think the most important thing I would say is that we did not dismiss the information uh, in the Norfolk SIR, the Norfolk Situational Information Report. In fact, quite the contrary. Uh, often when we get online chatter or raw information, uh, we take time, which would be our preference, to run it to ground and figure out whether or not it's real or not. Uh, because as you could imagine, there's all kinds of chatter out there, and some of it, uh, Ray, uh, let one, me just. This one was real, it was and, real. And, yes, and in this instance, rather than dismiss it, we distributed it to the Capitol Police uh, to the MPD, to the other partners on the Washington Field Office, Joint Terrorism Task Force, we did it in writing through an email, and as if that wasn't enough, we then made a point of briefing it at the command post briefing that evening, and as if that weren't enough, we put it in the portal so we could make sure that everybody got it, all of which were actions that we took, we wouldn't normally take, frankly, with raw 
unverified information but we thought the information was sufficiently concerning that we erred on the side of caution and tried to pass it to the relevant people not once not twice but three different ways all in the span of about twenty four hours so from our perspective we did try to pass that information now having said all of that having said all of that i don't want to leave you or any other member of this committee with the impression that we think that what happened on january sixth is ok i'm not the kind of guy and i think you and i know each other well enough to i know that i'm not i don't use words like outrage lightly to properly know because you didn't dismiss it so you passed it on there had to be some concern do you feel that you did everything within your power to adequately and properly notify law enforcement so that they would be adequately and properly prepared to deal with all hell breaking loose at the u.s capitol so Anytime there is a successful attack, much less an attack of the kind of scale and significance that occurred on January 6th, you can be absolutely sure that we are asking what else we can do, what we can do better, what we can do more of, what we can do differently in terms of collecting information, analyzing it, and disseminating. Uh, I'm not aware of information that we didn't share that we should have. I am concerned that we need to get better and better at uh, developing human sources to be able to anticipate acts like this in the future. And so that's one of the things that we're looking at, but we're gonna be looking at a whole slew of things because our goal is to bat a thousand and we do not consider what happened to be, what happened on January 6th to be remotely acceptable. And we're determined to do our part with all of our partners to make sure it never happens again. Gentlelady's time has expired. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back, Mr. Massey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, as you know, the uh, world's largest social media companies took the unprecedented step of canceling, blocking, or otherwise banning the president's social media accounts after January 6th. To the best of your knowledge, did anybody at the FBI or anybody representing the FBI or any other branch of the U.S. government consult with these social media companies before they took these actions? I'm not aware of any such consultations, no. And to the best of your knowledge, did the FBI or representatives of the FBI or any other branch of the government consult with the social media companies before they took the actions of canceling tens of thousands of accounts in that following week? Well, again, I can't, I'm not aware of any conversations that are the way you've just described them. Certainly, we do engage with social media companies where we pass them information uh, just like they pass us information and sometimes information that we pass to social media companies prompts them to then under their terms of service take certain action but whether that happened in this whether that happened in this particular instance i can't i can't say because i don't so know you're not aware of any i'm not aware of any action of the sort you've described from at least 2007 through 2016 the fbi conducted an investigation into evidence that the saudi government agents provided essential assistance to the first arriving 9-11 hijackers and the FBI and DOJ have publicly acknowledged that three Saudi government agents are primary subjects of that investigation which is named Operation Encore. We passed a law in Congress, JASTA, to ensure that the 9-11's family's case against Saudi Arabia could proceed. The 9-11 families issued a subpoena in 2018 for records from the FBI's 9-11 investigative files that are critical to that lawsuit. According to lawyers for those families of the victims, the FBI has refused to search its complete files for responsive documents, claiming it would be too burdensome to do so, and the FBI has withheld certain key documents and significantly redacted others, despite the fact that the records concern events that occurred 20 years ago. Will you commit today that the FBI will conduct a review of all its relevant 9-11 files on an expedited basis to identify documents relevant to the family's lawsuit and to produce them to the fullest extent possible without sacrificing justice for the victims in the name of diplomacy? Well, I, I will make sure that our folks are doing everything they possibly can consistent with our responsibilities. Uh, obviously, there are matters that are involved classified information. There are matters that involve grand jury information. I do know that the Justice Department has asserted the state secrets privilege and that I understand that that's been upheld by both the magistrate judge and the district judge about some information. 
I also know, though, and I think this is important for me to add, uh, that we have produced and worked diligently to produce thousands of documents, including right. ones that have rarely been released. And I would not um, want to leave this exchange without telling you how much I care about this issue. Uh, the families of the 9-11 victims matter deeply to me, and I, I know they're Will frustrated. You, let, me, l let me ask you then, would you commit to formally request that the DNI review documents the FBI has withheld from the families to determine if they can be released into public interest as she is authorized to do pursuant to Executive Order 13256? I'm happy to take a look with the DNI and others to see if there's more information that can be declassified. Okay, uh, real quickly, the NICS background check, with the F which the FBI runs, according to the GAO, in 2017, there were 112,000 denials and only 12 U U.S. attorney offices prosecutions. Now, I don't want you to impugn the, uh, the DOJ or the ATF for only prosecuting 12 out of 112,000 of these denials. What's obvious here is that there are some false denials. In fact, Probably a large majority of these denials are false denials. According to John Lott, who worked at the DOJ, because of similarities in surnames and first names among racial and ethnic groups, black Americans are three times more likely to get a false denial, and Hispanics are two times more likely to get a false denial than Caucasians. Does this, are you aware of this? I'm not aware of Mr. Lott's uh, findings. Would it concern you if there was racial disparity and that uh, law-abiding black Americans and Hispanic Americans were being deprived of their right to self-defense? Well, I would be concerned about false denials, and certainly I would be concerned about racial disparity. I, I, will you, you mentioned commit, the... Will you, will you commit to... Uh, <laughs> to investigating whether is whether there is racial disparity in the NICS background the, check results. The gentleman's time has expired. The uh, witness may answer the question. I'm happy to look further into the issue. I might have my staff follow up with yours to see that make sure that we have the same information that you're referring to, uh, but certainly you've raised issues that would that I'd want to look into further. Thank you, Director Ray. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Correa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Director Ray. I also want to thank you and your colleagues for your work in protecting Americans on a daily basis. I sit on Homeland Security, and I have a special appreciation for your work. Uh, if I can turn our attention a little bit to cybersecurity, uh, you mentioned that part of your job is to protect us from foreign nations like China and Russia. Very difficult job, an important job and a job that our national security depends on you doing it right the first time around. Uh, and Mr. Ray, if I can talk a little bit about the solar winds attack, that attack began as early as March 2020 and allowed Russian intelligence to access critical data and the breach went on for a number of months. And this, Mr. Ray, was a major breach. It accessed many federal agencies as well as the private sector and it went undetected for a number of months. Um, Mr. Ray, why did it take so long for our federal investigators to detect this breach? Well, the solar winds uh, breach or, or uh, intrusion uh, that you're referring to, uh, I think it's fair to say is one of the most sophisticated cyber campaigns ever. Uh, and it is a sobering reminder of the lengths our adversaries are willing to go to. And I say that because the SVR, and we've now publicly attributed it to the Russian SVR, uh, was basically clandestinely inserting a few lines of malicious code in widely used software, uh, and widely used software update that with tens, of, that has tens of thousands of lines of legitimate code, all to, even though ultimately uh, only targeted about a hundred or so for future exploitation, uh, and I think that Solar Winds intrusion highlights the importance of the private sector engagement piece. The FBI, on our end, uh, can pursue appropriate investigations, but what we can't do is just sit on networks and and Mr. wait Ryan. and look just in case. So we are aggressively sir, investigating. Sir, yeah, sir, if I can ask you a follow-up question, I, I refuse to accept the fact that the Russians are better than us at cyber. So my question is, 
uh, have you seen any evidence of internal obstruction or any internal assistance that would help to hide or impede the investigation into this cyber breach? <laughs> any obstruction? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm following the question. You mean by the, the company? Any evidence within the federal government? Oh, I see. Uh, of people assisting or obstructing, hiding this kind of attack on our nation? I'm not aware of, that I've seen anybody hiding the attack. I, like I said, it was a very sophisticated attack, uh, and I think we've aggressively made progress on it, and sanctions have been imposed now. Uh, and I think something like 38 different countries have joined us in different forms of messaging in support of our uh, attribution of this to the Russian SDR. And, and I would say, uh, Director Ray, that uh, we're in a very tough situation given that uh, such a major breach occurred in our federal government. Uh, recently, uh, uh, the Biden administration signed an executive order, President Biden signed an executive order uh, to improve the nation's cybersecurity and to increase federal capabilities to respond and get federal agencies to better coordinate their efforts uh, in this area. Can you speak as to how the FBI is working to implement this executive order? Uh, so I think what it, the executive order really highlights is the whole of government approach and frankly the whole of society approach that we need to take to the cyber threat. Um, the FBI, this, some, I've heard some people refer to cyber security and the cyber threat as kind of the ultimate team sport. Um, and in this case, the team includes not just the federal government and various federal agencies each playing its own role, but very importantly, the private sector where something like 85 to 90 percent, uh, as you may know from your other committee assignment, of the, our critical infrastructure is in the hands of the private sector. And then when you add on top of that, Americans' personal identifying information, PII, it's probably even higher than that that's in the private sector. And certainly our innovation, which is targeted by adversaries like China, even higher than that. So in our country, Director, configured the way I, we are, private sector engagement is the key. Sir, if I may very quickly say that uh, you're right, 80, 90 percent in the private sector, but this breach was of the federal government. And I believe even your FBI files may have been uh, compromised. So my, I'm hoping in my last few seconds here to say that I look forward to continuing to work with you, both in this committee and Homeland Security, to make sure that this does not occur again. Again, I refuse to accept the fact that either Russia or China has better cyber capabilities than the United States. Gentlemen, I yield. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Stubbe. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I, just, may I very quickly respond to that last question? Yes, the gentleman may respond. So first, I totally agree that the Russians and the Chinese are not better than we are, and you and I are aligned on that. Second, FBI systems were not compromised in the way that some of the other federal agencies were. And third, when I refer to the private sector in the context of solar winds, uh, it's important to know that the software update that was the vehicle through which the federal government was uh, compromised was a private sector organization. And that's what I meant by referring to the private sector in that context. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. The gentleman's time is, the gentleman yields back, Mr. Stubbe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, in your opening statement, you described the January 6th protests as, quote, an angry mob attempting to, quote, undermine our institutions of government. You then went out. To, you went on to paint BLM and Antifa violence as quote peaceful, lawful protests that quote others quote exploited to pursue violence. Why do you feel that you need to qualify Antifa and BLM violence as exploiting otherwise peaceful protests, but you didn't do the same for January six? Well, the when I was referring to the uh, civil unrest and the violence that occurred among the civil unrest, I was speaking obviously of a period that covered an entire summer in protests across multiple cities. Whereas, of course, in the January 6th instance, we're talking about a, um, a single event of massive significance, however, uh, in the course of one afternoon. And as I alluded to in response to earlier questions, uh, there were I think I've already said a couple times this morning uh, that there were on January 6th, uh, not people who were under investigation, but there were peaceful protesters who were rowdy, and then there were the other two groups, and it's the other two groups that were investigating and bringing criminal charges against. In one of those on January 6th um, that was in the Capitol, Ashley Babbitt, an unarmed protester, an Air Force veteran, 
was shot and killed in the Capitol by a police officer. Uh, Director Ray, yes or no, was the FBI involved in the investigation into Ashley Babbitt's killing? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that. I know that the decision to uh, to close the investigation was made by DOJ. The um, the officer well, involved the officer involved was not. If the you were involved in it, and you can answer whether the FBI was involved in it. Uh, I'm not sure that we were involved in that one, but I, I just sitting here right now, I can't remember for sure, so I don't want to misspeak. Okay. Well, on June second, twenty twenty, just days after the George Floyd incident, you incident, you gave a press conference in which you detailed the ways the FBI would assist with the Floyd investigation. Subsequently, the DOJ brought civil rights charges under eighteen U.S.C. two forty two against the officers involved. In a May seventh, twenty twenty one press release. DOJ publicly commended the FBI for its investigative efforts on the Floyd case. Yet in Ashley Babbitt's case, where civil rights charges under 18 U.S.C. 242 were also being considered by DOJ, the FBI didn't assist at all, and you're not sure that you were even involved in this investigation. So why did the FBI assist with the investigation of George Floyd's death, but not into Ashley Babbitt's death that occurred in the Capitol complex? Well, our decision to assist in the George Floyd case was based on, obviously, discussions with the Civil Rights Division under the prior administration of the Justice Department there. And the Ashley Babbitt case, I'm not trying to uh, create more confusion than is warranted. I'm just sitting here right now. I can't tell you for sure what role, if any, we played in that decision. So that's all I can really say on that one. Well, if, you, if you're not sure, then it obviously wasn't a very active role if you're not sure what involvement the FBI had on that. I, I, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would say that, sir. Uh, we actually have 37,000 employees conducting thousands and thousands of investigations, and though I do my best to try to stay on top of as many of them as I can, sitting here right now well, in the span of everything we're talking about, I can't say for sure whether or not we were involved. ...and how you were in the command center, so you would probably know if the FBI was involved in an investigation that occurred in an officer-involved shooting of an unarmed person on the Capitol complex if you were involved. As I said, I'll we've had hundreds of investigations. The most wanted website, there's an entire section entitled Capital Violence, targeting individuals who came to protest in D.C. on January 6th. Comparatively, little or no attention is paid to violent BLM and Antifa extremism. BLM and Antifa attacked the White House with President Trump inside of it last May and laid siege to the Mark O. Hatfield Federal Courthouse in Portland last summer. And the FBI doesn't seem interested at all. Can you explain what would appear to be a politically motivated discrepancy on the FBI's most wanted website. We used uh, social media and uh, putting out information and videos to the public, much as we have with January 6th, uh, in connection with the violence among the civil unrest over the summer. We got thousands and thousands of tips from the public in relation to the violence over the summer uh, and followed up on them. Uh, and in both cases, we used almost all 56 field offices. In both instances, we opened hundreds of investigations. In both instances, we conducted hundreds of arrests. We consider them both extremely serious. Uh, and as I've said several times over the course of this hearing today, we have one standard. And I don't care whether you're upset at our criminal justice system or whether you're upset at our elections. There's a right way and a wrong way in this country to do it under the First Amendment and committing violence assaulting federal law enforcement and destroying property is not the way to do it. And that's my standard for the FBI. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman's time, the gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Mr. Uh, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Director Ray, for being here today. Um, I'd like Mike. to focus my questions on foreign influence in our elections over the last several cycles and how that's contributed to the rise of extremist violence, which you highlighted in your opening remarks. I'm particularly interested in how Russia's escalating disinformation campaigns attacking the integrity of our American elections and our government contributed to the January 6th attack on this building, those who serve here, the brave officers who protect it, and the very foundations of our government. And I'm interested in the role that Russian disinformation and the use of American proxies in spreading that disinformation is playing in continuing efforts to contest Mr. Trump's loss of the 2020 election and efforts by state legislatures to enact laws inspired by conspiracy theories and lies about election fraud. Now, Russian disinformation is a particular concern for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which I represent, because our election system and even our electoral college votes have been attacked repeatedly by
by Russian agents and their domestic proxies, spreading propaganda and outright lies. The fact and the extent of those attacks has been detailed by multiple judicial, law enforcement, intelligence, and bipartisan congressional investigations, including the special counsel's report in 2019, the bipartisan Senate intelligence report last August, the indictment of more than a dozen go Russian government agents, and the National Intelligence Council's report on foreign threats to the 2020 elections in March of this year. Since this propaganda appears to have motivated people to participate in the Stop the Steal rally and the attack on the Capitol, and continues to motivate efforts in our state legislature to make it harder to vote, I'd like to direct your testimony to the longstanding and apparently continuing Russian efforts to undermine American confidence in our elections. And to start, I'd like to get one thing off the table, the difference between election interference and election influence. As I understand it, and referring to your prior testimony and the National Intelligence Council's report, election interference is defined as efforts to manipulate the mechanical aspects of voting, such as voter registration and election results. Is that right? Uh, that, that sounds right. I don't have the report in front of me, but I agree with you that it is important to make the distinction between interference and influence. Thank you. Well, I, I can give you a copy of the report if you'd like. Um, I'm not going to get that far into it. But um, specifically, the March report said there was, quote, no evidence, end quote, uh, not through intelligence collection on the foreign actors themselves, nor through physical security and cybersecurity monitoring of voting systems across the country, not through post-election audits, and not through any other means that a foreign government or other actors had compromised election infrastructure to manipulate election results. Do you stand by that conclusion? We contributed, obviously, to the National Intelligence Estimate and stand by that estimate. Thank you. So my concern is not fictitious election interference, which we know didn't happen, but actual election influence, which is propaganda designed to impact public opinion, and notably the long-standing Russian efforts to undermine public confidence in election processes and results by claiming that voting systems have been compromised. You said in your testimony before Homeland Security in 2020 that what concerns you the most is the steady drumbeat of misinformation. Um, Americans can and should have confidence in our election system and certainly our democracy, but you worried that people will have a feeling of futility because of all the noise and confusion that's generated. Should we still be concerned about a drumbeat of Russian misinformation, propaganda, that our elections are vulnerable to widespread fraud or manipulation? I think the, the, the drumbeat of misinformation from our adversaries, not just the Russians, but now also the Iranians, mm -hmm. uh, for example, is something that we uh, uh, absolutely should be concerned about. I think the country has made significant strides, not just in, in protecting our election infrastructure from interference, back mm -hmm. to your distinction there a minute ago, but also in highlighting the uh, prevalence of misinformation. So I do think as a general matter, the country is getting wiser to misinformation. Uh, and social media companies have started to play more responsible role than they used to uh, in helping to counter that. But it, uh, just as we're upping our game, our adversaries are upping our game too. Thank you. Um, one thing that's come cl uh, become more clear over the course of your testimony in the March report is that there was a shift in Russian tactics in 2020, and they, be they began to deploy their propaganda using domestic social media, um, and I, I believe the quote is U.S. officials and prominent U.S. individuals, some of whom were close to former President Trump. Um, certainly, Mr. Trump and many of his supporters have promoted conspiracy theories that claim without evidence that we cannot trust our election results. Uh, can you comment on whether since the 2020 election, Russia continues to promote propaganda and lies about the integrity of our elections and whether they're continuing to use U.S. proxies? The gentlelady's time has expired. The witness may uh, answer the question. Um, it, I would just say that Russian efforts at disinformation in this country continue. It's a 365-day uh, a year phenomenon. Um, beyond that, that's really probably all I could say right now. Thank you. I would seek unanimous consent to place in the record the March uh, 2021 report from the National Intelligence Council on foreign threats to the 2020 U.S. foreign elections. Thank you. I yield back. Without objection, the gentlelady yields back. Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, Director Ray, um, on May 14, 2021, yourself as director of the FBI and the secretary of DHS 
in consultation with the Director of National Intelligence, jointly produced a report containing a strategic assessment and data on domestic terrorism. Um, of note, the FBI finally designated the 2017 shooting of congressional Republicans as an act of domestic terrorism carried out by a domestic violent extremist rather than suicide by cop. As the FBI initially had classified the shooting, how did the FBI initially reach its conclusion that the attack was suicide by cop? And uh, who made the determination? And then ultimately, why was there a change, do you believe? Well, uh, Congressman, I appreciate the question. So um, as you may know, after uh, I think a very thoughtful conversation I had with Congressman Wenstrup in April, uh, I asked my team to go back and take a hard look at that particular shooting. And I think what we found is that from the time that I first arrived as director, the FBI's understanding of domestic violent extremism has evolved. And more and more, we see domestic violent extremists motivated by mixes or almost mishmashes of ideological, socio-political, and personal grievances. Uh, and I think the shooter at the baseball practice that day back in 2017, I think is fairly considered an early example of that phenomenon. And so that's part of why uh, I wanted to be clear that the FBI considers that shooting an act of domestic terrorism, that we look at it under the umbrella of domestic violent extremism, and that if it same thing had occurred today, we would absolutely open it as a domestic terrorist investigation. And we tried to make that explicit both directly to Congressman Wenstrup uh, and in the report that you referred to, which we formally transmitted to Congress. So would you consider that a change in posture by the FBI on domestic terrorists over, over, overall? Uh, well, it's part of a, I don't know about posture, but it's part of a, a more evolved understanding of the way in which domestic violent extremism affects this country. We are seeing much more often now, not people who commit attacks based on some nice, neat, cookie-cutter ideology, and this is their sole motivation, but rather people who take bits and pieces of things together with some personal beef and then attack. And we consider that to be, in many ways, the, the most uh, increasingly common form of domestic violent extremism. And so again, I would view not so much a change in posture as that attack was one of the earlier versions of this phenomenon that, that is quite rampant now. Like just the other day, we had these folks in, in Minneapolis, for example, who were so-called Boogaloo boys, but they were ultimately charged with trying to provide material support to Hamas. We had a guy the other day who uh, was subscribing to various uh, Islamist violent extremism, but also considered himself a neo-Nazi. And then with all of them wrapped up with them, you have these people who blend into it personal agendas have nothing to do with ideology at all. And so when you put all that together in sort of a salad bar of motivations, we think it's fair to look at something like the Simpson Field shooter as a domestic violent extremist, a domestic terrorist. And that's why, again, if it would happen today, I think we would certainly consider that part and parcel of what we call domestic terrorism. So it, in, since the George Floyd incident, there's been hundreds of flare-ups domestically in many of the larger municipalities throughout the nation. And, you know, it was a long, hot summer last, last summer. What is the approach that the FBI is taking as we, here we are at the beginning of June, as we look forward? And uh, how, what is the approach that the FBI is using with those types of domestic flare-ups that we're seeing, again, across the nation? Well, we're uh, lashed up very tightly with our state and local partners. Um, when I go, and I've been to all 56 of our field offices, most of them more than once, I'm almost at all of them at least twice now, I've met with law enforcement from all 50 states, chiefs, sheriffs, commissioners, colonels, et cetera, uh, and we're all very concerned about the rise in violent crime, the homicide rates in particular, and we all think that in some ways uh, the summer could be the worst yet uh, to come in a while. And so we're through our Safe Streets Task Forces, uh, through on the terrorism side, our Joint Terrorism Task Forces, our Violent Crime Gang Task Forces, um, a whole variety of ways we're working, trying to be lashed up very tightly with our state and local partners to do our part. And again, the FBI is just one part of a broader law enforcement response um, to try to make sure that we do our best to protect our neighborhoods. 
gentleman's time has expired. Yield back. The gentleman yields back. Ms. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I want to thank uh, Director Ray for uh, coming to visit with us again. I know it's been a long day, but just, just take a deep breath. We're, we're almost there. Uh, there's just a few more of us to go. Uh, but I want to first thank you and your 37,000 employees for the great job that you do in keeping America safe. Uh, I just want to first asso wanna associate myself with all of the uh, uh, concerns that many of us have raised about the, the uh, January 6th incident and everything that's happened. Uh, I think that it would be important for us to continue a full investigation. That's why we support a 9-11 type commission uh, so that we can get an investigation from top to bottom uh, to make sure we find out uh, who was responsible, holding them accountable and taking steps so it doesn't happen again. So. Hopefully the FBI can play a role in that uh, as we continue forward. I want to change the focus now uh, on, the lot, on some of the hate crime issues that, that I have uh, seen uh, not only across America, uh, but here in, in my city of Houston. Uh, let me be clear, it is inherently un-American and unconscionable for anyone to discriminate against another because of the color of their skin or where they're from. Yet here in Houston, just this last month, we've seen two incidents uh, that tell me that, that we're not doing enough. On May 14, a bus driver who refused to get off a bus attacked the Hispanic bus driver saying he hates wetbacks, uh, which you may know is a very derogatory uh, term. Uh, several charges were filed with an enhancement to a hate crime. Now, this was February 14. Two days later, May 16, uh, at a mall where they had one of these carnivals that kind of come and go, a group of carnival workers punched and kicked a man after they pulled him out of his vehicle and yelled racial slurs. They told the victim that they do not like, quote, black people, and they threatened to hang him. Two reported incidents, almost back to back, and both charges were filed for some, uh, some other things, and they were all enhanced to hate crimes. This tells me that it's still happening and happening too much. Our police department's hate crime report indicates that in Houston, uh, the hate crimes have almost tripled, tripled in the last 50 years. And many of the crimes here in, in Houston have been more related to Latino, uh, attacks against Latinos or as this, the, the incident I mentioned, May 16, uh, people thinking they're quote unquote wetbacks. So my question to you is how, is this a trend that you're seeing nationally of more attacks against Latinos or immigrants? Uh, and if so, what has that caused you to do to reallocate your resources and to make sure uh, that the FBI has what they need to investigate? I'm sure my comadre, uh, uh, Veronica Escobar, will, will later maybe talk about uh, the most horrific about the hate crimes, which was the, the, the gun shooting, shooting in, in El Paso. But what are y'all doing to step it up to make sure that we protect everyone, no matter where they're from? Well, I, I appreciate the question. Hate crimes are uh, certainly a high priority for us. We, in fact, um, uh, had a, from fiscal year 19 to fiscal 20, a 63% increase in FBI hate crimes investigations opened. Uh, and this year, fiscal year 21, uh, we've had the highest number of hate crime investigations initiated uh, in the past five years. So we have, that's about 370 or so hate crimes investigations pending, uh, and they cover the waterfront. You also heard me refer earlier, uh, I think, to the domestic terrorism hate crimes fusion cell that we created to try to capture the, the synergy between those two. So that's part of it. Uh, as far as, uh, and we also do a lot, we're trying to do a lot to engage with the community and with state and local law enforcement, because one of the things we know about hate crimes really across the gamut is that they are historically underreported. So a big part of it is trying to get. Right, but my question was, have you seen an increase in attacks against Latinos, and what are you doing to reallocate your resources to get to the root causes of that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure about root investigating root causes. We are investigating hate crimes, uh, including against Latinos. I, I don't have the figures for you about increases by well, uh, demographic, you, but yeah. You also mentioned, because my concern is that if we don't do enough, then we'll see what's happened here in Houston, that even victims don't report because they're scared, number one, 
and two, there's line speeders, and they don't see enough outreach from the FBI in, for people to be able to know. When you told us earlier, you want to, if you see something, you need to say something. But unless you tell that to people in Spanish, and you make sure you let them know that they're, that if they're victims of, of crimes, that they should report it, it's just not going to happen. I, I agree that public uh, outreach is time has expired. Important. The uh, witness may answer the question. Uh, and certainly, I know, for example, with the rise in um, hate crimes against uh, the Jewish community, we have, for example, in New York, uh, done an advertising campaign recently uh, in both in Hebrew and in Yiddish to try to make sure we're reaching people there. And so it may be that a similar approach uh, is underway from the relevant field offices. I know in El Paso, I personally visited the crime scene myself uh, as a measure of how seriously I take that attack. Thank Gen you, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, Ms. Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I would like to yield my time to the ranking member, Mr. Jordan. Uh, I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Uh, Director, it always seems that the leaks from our institutions and government agencies benefit Democrats. I mean, we just had the, as Mr. Bishop pointed out, we just have the fact that the IRS leaked the personal tax returns of U.S. citizens. This happened to be at the time the Democrats are trying to raise taxes on the American people. Um, and then, of course, there's what happened, if someone from the FBI or DOJ leaking information about the fact that Mr. DeJoy, at least it's been reported that Mr. DeJoy is under investigation, under investigation for, if, if you can believe what's written in the press, for alleged campaign finance violations that took place between 2012 I think in 2015, so even if he did it, it seems to me the statute of limitations has, has run. Um, so I wanna ask about that in particular. I, is there an internal investigation at the Justice Department or more specifically at the FBI? I know you have an inspections division. Uh, this is the division, on my understanding, that looked into Andy McCabe's issue when he leaked information that he shouldn't have leaked. Um, is there some kind of internal investigation going on? Well, uh, as you, uh, by now have probably come to expect from me, Congressman. Of course, I can't confirm any specific investigations, but what I can tell no, you- No, this is, I'm not talking about an investigation that the FBI is, I'm talking about an internal investigation to actions that, that someone in, in your division may have leaked information to the press regarding the Postmaster General. Likewise, I wouldn't confirm a specific investigation. We have our uh, inspection division has a unit dedicated to internal investigations, and we put some of our best people in it because of how important it is. We also have, uh, that I stood up in the last administration, uh, in our counterintelligence division, a dedicated leak unit to pursue criminal investigations where that uh, is appropriate. In some cases, they work with each other, you know, because there's an administrative side and a criminal side. But really, that's all I can say. I can't really confirm specific investigations. No, I, I understand, you've given that answer to us. And, and look, I get that. You've given that answer to us a thousand times a day and a thousand times, and the other times you testified, I, I understand that. But when we're talking about the Postmaster General of the United States, we're talking about uh, the tax returns of the American, um, of American citizens. Again, all conveniently timed, it seems to me. I mean, last summer, the Democrats, many Democrats called for the Postmaster General to step down. They had, the left had all kinds of protesters at his house last summer in the whole debate about, about mail-in voting. Um, and then we see this story sort of out of nowhere that, that supposedly uh, he's under investigation. I just was curious if you would tell us if it's internal. Does the FBI uh, give critical race theory training to your agents and employees? Uh, not to my knowledge. We certainly provide different kinds of diversity training, just like almost any organization these days. But certainly I've never heard of any kind of critical race theory training. But is, that, is that a yes or a no? Is there critical race theory training going on at the FBI, yes or no? And my answer is not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of, okay. Uh, how about this, um, the issue of this, Washington Post reported back in April that um, FBI had sent, quote, geofence search warrants to Google and got information about January 6th, phone numbers uh, of, of, of folks here on Capitol Hill. And that include members uh, and staff and others who were authorized to be in the Capitol on that, on that date. Um, how did you distinguish, uh, it's our understanding according to, to the news reports there's an exclusion list of, of folks who were, you know, supposed to be in the Capitol that day. How is that all, how is that all being handled? How did you determine who, who's on the exclusion list, who isn't? How did you get that information and what are you doing with that information now? Particularly the phone numbers and identifying, uh, uh, identi identifying phones of 
members of Congress and staff who are supposed to be on Capitol Hill? So I think you, you anticipated probably the most important part in, in your question, which is, again, and I want to be careful not to talk about any specific investigation, um, but the geolocation data that we're talking about is, again, it's not, uh, doesn't identify a person, it identifies a device. And so one of the first things we needed to do, because on January 6th itself, our focus was on trying to secure you all and the facility, so we weren't arresting people here on site. So after the fact, we needed to figure out who was here by looking at the list of device numbers. And then with that, we needed to be able to get from, and I think we got it from the Capitol Police, but I'm not sure about that, a list of who was, as you said, supposed to be here so that we could exclude those people and focus on the numbers of we know that who were not people, supposed to be here. No, I, I and, and then using those numbers, then start to pursue logical investigative leads of the people who were not supposed to be no, here. No, I appreciate that, uh, and, and thank you. But some people who were supposed to be here, we know were subsequently called. Um, by the FBI, and they were staff on Capitol Hill. Um, that's because you didn't know, you were finding out I mean, what, what, was going, what was going on there. The general lady's time has expired. The gentleman may, the uh, witness may answer the question. Well, again, I don't want to speak to any specific investigation, but our reasons for going to interview witnesses about things uh, are a lot more than geolocation data. So it may have been that we saw a video footage of somebody and we think this person saw something in this place or some witness told us go talk to this person because they know what happened over here. So there's a whole host of reasons why we would have gone to interview somebody that might have nothing to do with geolocation data. So I can't really speak to any specific person who was- The exclusion- The general lady's time, totally ex the general lady's time has expired. Mr. Nagus. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, uh, first I want to say thank you for your testimony and I want to thank you as well for your service to our country. Uh, several years ago, as you might be aware, a young man named Elijah McClain died in Colorado, my state, after being placed in the two chokehold by police officers and then being administered ketamine by paramedics during an arrest. Nearly one year ago, on June 30th of 2020, the Colorado U.S. Attorney's Office, the Department of Justice, and the Denver Division of the FBI announced that in 2019 they had begun reviewing the facts of this case for potential federal civil rights investigation. And I'll quote from their statement. They said, quote, the standard practice of the DOJ is to not disclose the existence or progress of investigations. However, there are specific cases in which doing so is warranted if such information is in the best interest of the public and public safety. Recent attention on the death of Elijah McClain warrants such disclosure, end quote. Uh, given that statement, Director Ray, can you confirm whether the DOJ has opened up a federal civil rights investigation into this matter? I would need to consult with the department about what information we can provide in response to that question, but I'm happy to have my staff circle back to you after we've done that. Thank you. I appreciate that, Director Ray, and, and uh, we'll follow up with you this morning. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mr. McLean was administered the ketamine by EMS personnel. Uh, in your opinion, are there any acceptable non-medical reasons for law enforcement officers to administer or encourage attending EMS personnel to use sedatives or other medications to subdue a person under arrest? I, I'm really not comfortable trying to answer a, a hypothetical that cuts across such a broad range of possible scenarios. Um, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to um, decline to really offer much on that particular subject. I'm not sure I'm the right person to speak to. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Director Ray. I would I simply say, in my opinion, it's, it's not acceptable for law enforcement to administer EMS personnel to be administering ketamine to subdue a person under arrest outside of a hospital setting. And it's why uh, we'll be introducing legislation to ensure that ketamine is used for medical purposes and only not as a tool of restraint. And we look forward to working with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies on that legislation. I want to turn to a different topic, which uh, my colleague Representative Cicilline touched on uh, earlier. You'll recall, uh, Director Ray, uh, during the morning and portion of today's hearing, which is the epidemic of gun violence in America. On March 22nd of this year, a gunman killed 10 people, including a police officer, at a grocery store in my district in Boulder, Colorado, allegedly using an AR-15 style pistol, which fired rifled rounds and had been modified with non brakes. The AR pistol brace attachment, as you know, allows the shooter to fire an easily concealable pistol with rifle-like accuracy and firepower. And I would like you, Director Ray, uh, if you might, to describe, in your view, how these types of weapons, these short-barreled rifles, can pose additional risk to law enforcement and ultimately to the community. 
Well, uh, I appreciate the question, Congressman. I, I think, uh, to first, just to be clear, I, I don't want to be weighing in on specific legislative proposals, but from a law enforcement perspective, uh, and of course there are a variety of different types of, of high-powered or high-capacity type weapons that are out there, uh, those are uh, things that can be of particular concern to any time there's a, uh, an operation that law enforcement is conducting. It's something we have to be particularly mindful of. I and mean, of course, this hits particularly close to home for me and for us at the FBI because the two special agents that I mentioned in my opening, Laura Schwarzenberg and Dan Alfin, uh, were shot and killed by an individual um, a child pornography uh, subject uh, using an AR style weapon. Uh, he killed those two agents uh, and injured uh, four others uh, who thankfully have survived. So it's an illustration of how the wrong weapon in the wrong hands um, is something that we should all be deeply concerned about. Well, I appreciate that, Director Ray, and, and we certainly grieve and mourn uh, with you uh, for uh, the agents that you've lost and, and for their families. Recognize their, their great sacrifice and service to our country. And I share your concern, and, and I think many here on Capitol Hill do as well. It's why uh, the Biden administration's decision, at least with respect to the uh, short barreled rifles and assault pistols regulations that they have now, uh, the president has asked uh, the ATF uh, to uh, issue. I joined the president and Attorney General Garland at a press conference uh, not that long ago, about seven weeks ago, regarding that step. I think it was an important step and moved us in the right direction, but uh, there's clearly other steps that we need to take as a Congress to ensure that these weapons of war uh, are not in our community so that we can keep uh, the entire community, including members of law enforcement, safe. And with that, I thank you again, Director Ray, and I would yield back the balance of my time to the Chairman. The Chair recognizes the uh, Representative Owens for five minutes. Can you, or just need to unmute. you unmute? Sorry, okay. <clears throat> According to the USA Today, uh, last year, 2020, the United States tallied more than 20,000 murders, the highest total since 1995, and 4,000 more than 19, uh, 2019. Preliminary FBI data for 2020 points to a 25% surge in murders, the highest single year increase since the agency began publishing uniform data in 1960. For the record, hate is hate, hate is evil, regardless of the color. To the victims of hate and their families, it makes no difference the color of the perpetrator. The result is the same, death. Looking at the numbers, I'm gonna guess that white on black crimes are up, black on white crimes are up, black on Asian crimes are up, attacks against uh, Hispanics and Jewish communities are up. And for sure, black on black crime is up. 90% of the black crimes was perpetrated on black Americans were done by other blacks. This evil of hate has become so prevalent that too many Americans, both black and white, simply shrug their shoulders, think it's normal, and turn the page. I keep hearing from my friends across the aisle about white supremacy, but based on the uncomfortable high death tally of black Americans in our own communities, it's evident that evil white supremacist is not our greatest, is the greatest threat. It is evil black perpetrators, predators living among us. I ask my fellow lawmakers not to continue to think this plague is, of evil is normal. Shrug our shoulders and turn the, back, turn the page. It's time for us to work together to end the policies that's keeping too many poor black Americans living mostly in urban cities, living in fear, illiteracy, joblessness, hopelessness, and anger. With that, I want to turn the remainder of my time over to uh, Mr. 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 Bill. Uh, I thank the gentleman for yielding. I appreciate his uh, important points. Um, Director, earlier you said, and I think I'm quoting accurately here, we pass information back and forth with social media companies. Um, can you explain that? Because, I mean, just read maybe out of context, I think people have concerns about that. Can you tell me what that means? I appreciate the question, and I, as I think back to my answer to that question, I, I was fearful that it might get misconstrued, so I appreciate you asking. Uh, what I was referring to um, is a couple different things. So one, in connection with uh, foreign misinformation, election influence stuff from, for example, the Russians. There have been instances where we will, based on intelligence we've received from overseas or other places, pass that to social media companies saying, hey, you know, we know this particular account 
is actually controlled by some Russian troll farm, for example, and then the social media companies then take action against that account. But they then do their own internal investigation, and that then sometimes leads them to Are we talking about a foreigner or an American? Down. What's that? Are we talking about a person, if, and if we're talking about a person, is it a foreign person or an American? Well, the, you know, the, the classic example, the one that I just gave, is a, you know, a foreign source who is essentially posing as a, a U.S. Um, voice. Uh, and that's the essence of the Russian troll farm that, that's been gotten so much attention. So then in turn, the social media companies take action. They often will find other accounts linked to that account and take appropriate action. We've seen the same thing uh, it, to some extent with the Iranians uh, in connection with the last election. You may remember when Director Ratcliffe and I did a press right. conference. Right. There's a little bit of that going on there. So. That's kind of the essence of the back and forth with social media companies that I was referring to. There are other situations, other situations where sometimes social media companies see a threat to life, a violent threat of some sort uh, on their platforms that they will refer to us, which is the responsible thing to do. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to be clear. There are times at the direction of the government, social media companies take certain action. Not at the direction, no. You just said we, you give them information. You said we, we're concerned about this, who we believe to be a foreign actor. I mean, it, it, let me step back a second. I think the broader concern is we just recently saw uh, communications that were largely redacted between uh, Dr. Fauci and the head, uh, the, the, the CEO the, or the head of Facebook, most of it redacted. And we know what the result of all that was a year ago was keeping information that they at the time deemed misinformation, but in fact wasn't. In fact, very credible information that they kept from the American people. And so that's my broader concern. It sounds to me like you're, this is something different potentially, but that's the concern we have, I think, as members of the Judiciary Committee, and frankly, I, I know American citizens have. So when you say passing information back and forth, working with these social media companies, we're in the context now of this communication, this email communication between Mr. Zuckerberg and, and Dr. Fauci that is largely redacted, but we know what that they colluded to keep information from the American people. Yeah, we're, we're, I understand your concern. We're talking about two very different things. First off, social media companies aren't taking action under their terms of service at our direction. And some days I wish they might, but that ain't happening. I don't wish that. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm nervous kidding. about I'm, all of it. I'm being a little flippant, but, um, uh, but no, we pass information. We're investigating. We ask them for information. And in the course of passing information to them, they then use that information and sometimes make decisions, again, they would tell you. If this information involves own. an American Gentleman's citizen, there would have to be a warrant expired. involved, right? Gentlemen's time has expired. You can answer this question. Thank you. I'm sorry, you, could you this repeat? If this information please? involves an American citizen, there would have to be some kind of warrant involved. The government's asking for information from a social media company. There would have to be some kind of warrant involved for you to get that information. Well, there's a variety of kinds of legal process, you know, uh, subpoenas, et cetera, where we pass information, where we're asking for information from them. They provide information in response to the legal process from us. A lot of the engagement that we're talking about is not that different from the engagement that we have with lots of other industries as well, you know, financial services, et cetera. Thank you. Um, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, is recognized for unanimous consent. Uh, Madam Chair, I ask for unanimous consent to submit three documents for the record. Uh, one is a Chris Houston report on uh, the threat of the hang him carnival worker charged with hate crime after punching, kicking man in the parking lot of Alameda Mall. The second uh, is from uh, Channel 13, Metro rider charged with hate crime enhancement after allegedly attacking bus driver in Tulsa City. And the third is the Houston Police Department annual hate crime report that indicates the uh, three times the increase of hate crime. Uh, Madam uh, Chair, I ask for unanimous consent. With that objection, and uh, now uh, Thanks, the- Thanks, I yield back. Sure, thank you. The gentlewoman from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much for conducting this oversight hearing today. And thank you, Director Ray, for being here. We really appreciate your time uh, and effort. And I represent Georgia, where we have unfortunately had some very high profile incidents of violence in the very past few years, and including the Ahmaud Aubrey killing uh, as recent, and also eight uh, individuals, and including the six women um, of Asian descent um, that just happened this past March. So these shootings just have continued to rattle our communities and are especially troubling for communities of color. 
And unfortunately, we know that these high profile incidents are just part of a broader trend of increasing hate crimes that we're seeing all across the country. My colleagues have already earlier today just uh, mentioned the startling statistics from the FBI's annual report showing the increases in hate crimes against Latinos, um, Jewish people, and also those of Asian descent. I just have one question in this regard there. How is the FBI taking steps to help local police respond to the rise in the anti-Asian hate crimes? So as I mentioned, hate crimes are a high priority to me. Uh, you mentioned Georgia, of course, that is my home as well. Uh, so I take them, uh, those cases particularly seriously uh, and personally there. Um, we do a number of different things. Uh, one, we obviously investigate hate crimes wherever we can. And as I mentioned, we have had the highest number of hate crime initiations this year uh, that we've had in the past five years and about a 63% increase in hate crimes investigations initiated over the past couple of years or so. So it's about 370, give or take, hate crimes investigations ongoing right now. We also provide support to uh, state and local, because sometimes the most readily provable offense is a state or local offense. And even in those instances, we provide support with forensics, uh, expertise, that kind of thing. We work with the Civil Rights Division over at, at uh, the Justice Department to figure out when federal charges can be brought. But we also do a lot of public outreach, both to the community and to law enforcement. One of the themes we've heard about a little bit already today and discussed is the fact that these crimes aren't reported reliably enough or uh, it's, just, it's a chronically underreported area. So, and that is something that we need to reach out to the communities and to law enforcement. So we do trainings, liaison events. Uh, for example, in the AAPI community, I think we've done 60 or so uh, events, liaison events specifically targeting that community just since last March, uh, right through the pandemic. With the Jewish community, I think there have been 340 or so training and liaison events. Uh, I mentioned earlier in New York, we recently put that as sort of a public uh, service campaign, uh, including putting it in Hebrew and Yiddish to reach uh, certain parts of the community that might be reluctant or unwilling to report. So there's a whole bunch of things like that that we're trying to do Thank to you. help. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. I, I'd also like to discuss those guns. And just recently, the president and the attorney general proposed new regulations for parts that uh, needed to build ghost guns to have serial numbers and those uh, that are purchasing them undergoing background checks. And as you know, ghost guns are firearms that can be easily produced from an online kit that requires no background check or has no serial number. Is the current data showing an increase in ghost guns found at these crime scenes? And you can just give me a simple yes or no answer to that. Uh I'm not sure I have the reliable numbers, but I do believe we are anecdotally starting to seize so-called ghost guns more and more frequently. Uh, and in, of course, in the wrong hands, those can be very dangerous, uh, just like other kinds of guns. And I believe, as you alluded to, DOJ has recently issued a, uh, a proposed rule on the subject. Right. And as you know, law enforcement relies heavily on gun tracing in their criminal investigations. And I understand that law enforcement is just unable to trace ghost guns because they lack those serial numbers. So why, can you please tell us why gun tracing uh, is so important and how does the inability to trace ghost guns impact criminal, inve criminal investigations and your own, the FBI's ability to help the public stay safe? Well, uh, tracing firearms is a time-honored uh, tactic in law enforcement investigations of crimes of violence. Um, and there's, it's an all-too-common scenario where you're recovering a firearm uh, and need to figure out where it came from. Um, and so, uh, absolutely, it's something we need to do as much as we can. That's, that's why, for example, uh, outside the context of ghost guns, you have individuals, for example, who will obliterate serial numbers. Uh, the reason they try to obliterate the serial numbers is precisely the, the reason that you alluded to, which is they want to prevent us from being able to trace the weapon. Uh, that is already a crime to obliterate a serial number, but um, certainly it's a subject that uh, uh, is increasingly concerning to us as we start to seize uh, ghost guns, so-called ghost guns, in a number of our cases. Time of the gentlelady. Thank you. 
I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Director Ray. Uh, good afternoon at this point. Before I begin, I just want to say thank you for the job that you do, and please pass on my thanks to the women and men who serve with you at the FBI. Their efforts are diligent, tireless, and too often thankless. So please let them know we appreciate their work. I have a couple lines of questions uh, that I have for you. First, I'd like to ask you about an ongoing violent epidemic, an issue that's of critical importance to me and my home state of Arizona. Uh, as you may recall, the last time you testified before this committee, we discussed the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. It's a grim reality that Native American women are murdered at a rate 10 times the national average. And for Native American women, homicide is the third leading cause of death. The National Crime Information Center was reported approximately 1,500 missing indigenous people, and Arizona tragically has the third highest number of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in the country. Recently, Congress acted. We passed the Vannas Act, which directs the DOJ to re review, revise, and develop protocols to address this crisis, and the Not Invisible Act, which coordinates intergovernmental efforts to combat this violence. There's a presidential task force addressing this crisis. Uh, our former colleague, Secretary Deb Holland, established a missing and murdered unit at the Department of the Interior, and the FBI has directed to enhance its investigations into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. So as FBI director, what specifically are you doing to seek justice for these victims? What are you doing to coordinate with other agencies? And what additional training and resources are you providing to your agents in Indian country? I appreciate the question. I do remember our exchange from the last time we testified, or last time I testified before this, uh, this committee uh, on this subject. Um, certainly, as you mentioned, there is the task force that's specifically focused on missing and murdered American Indians and Alaskan Natives. Uh, our primary vehicle to engage on this subject uh, is through the FBI's Safe Trails Task Forces, uh, which include not just FBI personnel, but partner personnel from other agencies, including tribal law enforcement. I think we have about 140, give or take, uh, agents that I've dedicated specifically to those Safe Trails Task Forces. That number is actually probably almost double that now in a way, because as you may know, uh, in Oklahoma, uh, the, uh, because of the Supreme Court's McGirt decision, the uh, range of, uh, of crime that's now considered Native American jurisdiction uh, has dramatically expanded. So we've probably about 140 surged agents to deal with uh, crime of the sort you're describing in that state. I also uh, took the head of our uh, FBI field office in Arizona, but also in New Mexico with me together and met with uh, the head of the Navajo Nation and spent some time with his leadership team and drove around uh, Indian country to get a better sense of the challenges out there. And I w I'm told that I'm the first FBI director uh, to ever go meet with them. Thank you, director, very much. Uh, I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk more about ransomware, a subject that other members have asked about. In this case, I want to talk specifically about the issue of ransomware attacks that threaten local governments and local infrastructure. Uh, before serving in Congress, I served as the mayor, mayor of Phoenix, Arizona. So I'm particularly concerned about cyber criminals targeting our local governments. And in recent years, we've seen major U.S. cities like Atlanta and Baltimore hampered by ransomware attacks. So based upon the data and pattern of attacks the Bureau has identified, what local infrastructure facilities do you believe are most at risk of being targeted, and what can Congress and the FBI do to better support our local government officials? Well, uh, I'm not sure I could give you a specific type of, of local uh, network that's most at risk, because it, it has less to do with the um, the type of service they provide so much as it is with their own IT infrastructure and the vulnerability that it represents, combined with the perception that ransomware actors have that they would be a particularly easy to leverage target. But you are absolutely right 
that one of the trends we're particularly concerned about with ransomware is more sophisticated targeting uh, of, uh, for example, municipalities uh, or uh, in, say, states that are more rural, rural hospitals and things like that, school systems uh, as another example. Um, and so we are trying to go after the ransomware actors through a variety of means. Our National Cyber Investigative uh, Joint Task Force leads a whole of government campaign that's prioritizing the most damaging variants of ransomware and going after the entire cyber criminal ecosystem. So by that I mean not just the, uh, the people demanding the ransom, but the malware developers, the money launderers, the shady internet service providers. We're going after the actors, their helpers. We're going after the criminals infrastructure. We're going after their cryptocurrency. Uh, so we're trying to engage in joint sequenced uh, operations designed to maximize the impact on the adversaries. And then we're trying to feed the information we get back uh, and learn from those investigations in the form of intelligence that we share with potential victims. Uh, so in your example, local governments, municipalities, but also all the victims in the private sector, indicators of compromise and things like that, and then working with CISA over at the uh, Department of Homeland Security to better help those victims protect themselves. But this is, uh, I used the expression before, a team sport. This is a team sport where the team is not just government, federal government, not just, frankly, local government, but also, very importantly, the private sector in a whole variety of ways. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Director Ray, for being here today, more importantly, for your service to our country, and especially the tr tremendous talented men and women of the FBI. Thank you for their service. Uh, as you've said often, the mission of the FBI is to protect the American people and to uphold the Constitution of the United States. Two important parts of that mission. My first focus today will be on the scourge of gun violence and how we can partner, continue to partner, because it's going to be all hands on deck in order to reduce and I hope someday eliminate the scourge of gun violence. Before I came to Congress, I served in the Pennsylvania House for six and a half years and had the chance uh, to meet with the, the state police who administered our PIC system, the Pennsylvania Instant Check System. Uh, and as you know, uh, you, the FBI, administer the NICS system. The difference between the two systems is important. Uh, the NICS system, as you know, has, uh, and both, I want to say, operate with tremendous speed. I give all those who administer these uh, great credit. Um, the PIC system uh, has a difference that I think is critically important that I hope we will someday build into the NICS system. PICS allows 10 days for the state to try to get clarity on a background check uh, to see if the person is a prohibited purchaser. And after that 10 days, if there is not clarity, uh, it defaults to no. Uh, the NICS system, as you know, uh, allows just three days. Uh, and if there, it can't get clarity, it defaults to allowing uh, the purchase of the gun. Uh, sadly, we know uh, that it was uh, that same loophole that allowed Dylan Roof, uh, after three days, to purchase a weapon which he later used to murder nine people at Emanuel AME Church in Charleston. Uh, just uh, several days later, it was revealed that he was a prohibited purchaser. In 2018, more than 27, uh, excuse me, 270,000 NICS background checks not completed within three business days resulted in more than 4,800 uh, gun transfers to people whose background checks ultimately revealed they were prohibited purchasers. Per the most recent FBI report, about 3,000 people a year uh, passed the NICS background checks as a result of this loophole. You know that we passed H.R. Uh, 1446. Uh, which would be the enhanced background closing of that Charleston loophole. Do you agree that NICS could be a more effective background system if we put forward that logical 10-day default to no? Well, um, as is customary, I'm not in a position to comment on specific legislative proposals as FBI director but uh, and get out in front of the administration on that. But what I would say is that our NICS folks work incredibly hard, um, and last year, even with 40 million, a record number of background checks, uh, and even with the pandemic, they were still able to process 
96 percent uh, or close to 96 percent within the required time. But certainly it gets hard and COVID made it even harder in many ways because, of course, part of the drill and it's probably the same with PICS, they have to reach out to the state and local um, what we know, I, I appreciate that, and I, yeah. I absolutely admire the, the work and the commitment of the folks who are administering NICS, but with their pressure, the increased numbers and the increased pressure to get it done in three days, otherwise it's allow the purchase. Uh, that has proven to be a lethal loophole, uh, as we know way too many times. Uh, you know, in November of 2017, Congress passed uh, the Fix NICS Act, and it was following another shooting. Uh, in a church in Sutherland Spring, Texas, uh, to ensure that federal agencies were reporting convictions uh, that would prohibit firearm ownership. However, recent data shows a gross underreporting uh, coming from uh, DOD in which all four military branches provided less than 31% of the requisite background check information. Is the FBI committed to supporting agencies to meet the fix NICS requirements? Uh, well, certainly the Fix NICT, Fix NICS Act uh, has been a, a big help to us, uh, and we've had a significant, very significant increase in new records over the past three years. Uh, we are trying to do our part to engage with our partners, um, federal, state, and local, uh, to increase the information that's in there. That's the whole point. That's the essence of the system, uh, and we're doing a lot of outreach and engagement. Uh, we've got massive staffing and technological resources devoted to it, and we've asked for more in the various budgets uh, that have been put forward. I, I know my time is up, sadly. There's so much more I'd like to ask you about, um, but I do hope that FBI will partner with us, the legislative branch in this administration, to do something about uh, gun violence. Uh, also, the second area that I wanted to make sure we talk about at some point is the use of force statistics and the collection of that data. Uh, so maybe I'll have a chance to talk with you and your staff uh, separately and offline. With that, I yield back and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady yields back, Ms. Escobar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, thanks so much for being here and many thanks to you and the women and men of the FBI for your service. We know that leading up to the January 6th attack, former President Donald Trump and others pushed the big lie that the election was stolen. We know that his political organization funded the January 6th Stop the Steal rally in Washington, D.C. We know that he told his supporters to attend. At the rally, we know he whipped them up into a frenzy and warned them that if they, quote, don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore, end quote. And then he directed them to go to the Capitol. Leading up to and even still in the wake of the deadly attack on the Capitol, We've seen and heard Republican members of Congress, as well as Republican state, local leaders, and candidates continue to spread the dangerous and deadly big lie. We've also seen it amplified by very irresponsible media outlets. Earlier, you told us, if you see something, say something. Well, I've seen and heard something, so I'm telling you about it today. There's a new and dangerous lie. The former president is telegraphing that he will be reinstated in August. This lunacy is being amplified by incredibly irresponsible parties. What's most alarming is that this new lie is quickly gaining support in Trump's political party. Currently, one in three Republicans believe he will be reinstated as president in August. Despite everything we knew via open sources about threats of violence on January 6th, there were catastrophic failures leading up to the attack on, on our capital and on our democracy. Taking into consideration the growing popularity of this new dangerous lie, as FBI director, is this on your radar? Are you concerned about this? And what are you doing ahead of August to prevent another January 6th? So uh, I guess a couple of things I would say on this. Um, First, as I think I testified earlier, um, like former Attorney General Barr, like former Acting Attorney General Rosen, uh, we've looked at the issue with an open mind, but we did not find the evidence of fraud that would have changed or could have changed the outcome of the presidential election. Now, as to uh, rhetoric that's out there, I think I have to be careful not to be weighing in as FBI Director on different people's uh, rhetoric. 
Uh, we speak through our work, we speak through our investigations, uh, but we have a very, very active domestic terrorism investigation program. Um, we have, uh, even before January 6th, under my watch, we elevated, uh, as you've heard me testify earlier today, elevated racially motivated violent extremism to our highest threat band, and we have doubled, I doubled the amount of domestic terrorism investigations, including in this space, uh, over the prior years, and now with January 6th, that number has exponentially increased. So we're very actively at work on this subject uh, and determined to do our part to make sure that what happened on January 6th never happens again. Director Ray, are you, are you paying attention to what's happening with regard to uh, the claims about August? Yes or no? Uh, we are looking at all sorts of information uh, that's out there as we try to evaluate and uh, distribute intelligence and conduct investigations, uh, and that's what I would say on that subject. Okay. Well, I want to shift now a little bit. Uh, we'll shift the, the subject to white supremacy, anti-immigrant rhetoric, and the threats that this toxic combination poses to security and communities like mine. We have and will unfortunately continue to hear Republican members of Congress try to paint immigrants as criminals, asylum seekers as invaders, and border communities like mine as unsafe. That rhetoric, especially the use of the word invasion, which one of my colleagues on this um, committee used multiple times in this hearing, the use of the word invasion is dangerous. And indeed, that same language was used by a domestic terrorist who drove from his home in Allen, Texas, to my community, El Paso, Texas, on August 3rd, in order to slaughter Mexicans and immigrants. Members have more than once asked you questions about terrorists at the border. I'm sure, Mr. Ray, as FBI director, that you are aware that attempted entry into the US by known terrorists is extremely rare on the southern border and in fact, far more likely to happen and is happening frequently at airports. So when responding to questions like those you've heard from my colleagues about terrorists on the border, questions that are intended to fuel xenophobia, I'm asking that you as FBI director, that you provide the context I just provided. It would be important in order to diffuse the anti-immigrant rhetoric that puts communities like mine at risk. I thank you for your testimony, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, Mr. Jones. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director Ray, for your time today. You've been very patient with all of us. Uh, be before I go further, I, I do want to encourage you to uh, allow your staff to receive an education in critical race theory. I know that certain members of this committee could certainly benefit from that kind of educational experience. Uh, unsurprisingly, I want to ask you about what happened on January 6th. Uh, a sitting member of Congress recently described that assault as a, quote, normal tourist visit, if you can imagine that. Uh, would you describe what happened at the Capitol on January 6th as a, quote, normal tourist visit? Just yes or no? That's not the way I would describe it. Okay, thank you. Uh, the insurrectionists were seen with handcuffs, zip ties, explosive devices, bear spray, and tactical gear. Director, yes or no, would you bring those weapons on a tourist visit to the Capitol? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, the January 6th attack on the Capitol was planned out in the open, and it was incited by the former President of the United States, make no mistake about that. Uh, but the danger did not end on January 6th. As many of my colleagues today have discussed, the threat of domestic terrorism by white supremacists anti-government forces and militias is at an all-time high. With that in mind, Director, I want to ask you whether several troubling recent incidents raise red flags in your mind about these threats. For example, Michael Flynn, the former National Security Advisor, said at a rally, quote, I want to know why what happened in Myanmar can't happen here. No reason it shouldn't happen here. Does that suggestion of a military coup raise a red flag to you, Director? Simple yes or no. Uh, with respect, I, I just don't think it's appropriate for me as FBI Director to be weighing in uh, on other people's 
public comments. It's not that I'm not sympathetic to the reason you're asking the question, but in my role, I think I have to be careful to speak through our work. And when the FBI director speaks, I speak through our investigations and our intelligence products. And so I just, I don't think I should be starting to start chiming in on other people's public chatter or rhetoric, no matter what it is. Well, director, I mean, it's true that you have an obligation to protect the American public, right? And to the extent you can help the American public to understand what kind of dangerous rhetoric poses a threat to the safety and security of the American people, uh, you can do so as a public service. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, he, this guy is calling for a military coup. Is that something that would not be of concern to you in your capacity as the FBI director? Certainly a military coup would be of great concern to me if I thought it was Thank you, director. Uh, or consider this, prominent officials within one party, uh, I'll just say at the Republican Party, have attended events and spoken alongside white nationalists, instigators of the insurrection on January 6th, and leaders of domestic terrorist groups. Uh, when leaders of one of our major political parties in this country attend extremist events, does that, or does their attendance lend legitimacy to those extremists who are seeking to bring other folks into the fold and, and convert people to their ideologies, yes or no? Again, I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult here, but it's just with respect, I don't think it's my role or the appropriate role for any FBI director to be uh, weighing in on other people's First Amendment activity. What I think we need to do at the FBI is to act through our work to aggressively investigate domestic violent extremism, to investi aggressively investigate election influence or interference, to aggressively investigate the things that we are entrusted with investigating to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. Let me ask you this. Not that I'm not unsympathetic to why you're asking the question, but I, I understand. Don't think that's I, my I, role. I suspect I suspect the answer is yes. If if you were to to be forthcoming about that, how about this? A former attorney to President Trump falsely stated, "quote It should be that he can simply be reinstated." And I think you've heard other my colleagues say this today. Uh, Biden, to finish this quote, is told to move out of the White House, and President Trump should be moved back in. Could statements like that encourage attacks of the kind that we saw on January 6th, yes or no? Same answer. Wow. Uh, Director Ray, I've asked you these questions because the insurrectionists threatened more than our lives. They threatened our democracy, and the fact is they still do. I hope that you see that. Uh, those who incited the assault with their calls to stop the steal now threaten to incite another one with their calls to stage a coup or to, quote, reinstate Donald Trump. The violent far-right nationalism that caused the insurrection is still with us, stoked by elected officials and even the former disgraced, defeated president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Uh, and the American people, sir, need to know that the FBI is working as hard to protect our democracy as the far-right is working to overturn our democracy. The I hope that we can have that confidence, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, uh, the gentleman yields back, Ms. Ross. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you very much, Director Ray, for being with us today and for your patience. I know it's been a long day. Um, I have two lines of questioning, so um, hopefully we can get through the first one quickly because my second one is the area where uh, Congresswoman Dean wanted to talk about use of force. Um, but the first I have to go to because I'm from North Carolina and it deals with the Colonial Pipeline. And in my district, um, mm -hmm. during that horrible week long period, about three quarters of our gas stations uh, simply didn't have the fuel for uh, my constituents. Can you walk me through the different ways that a company employing inadequate cybersecurity measures could endanger federal supply chains um, like the like this case, and especially with um, crucial needs like oil and gas infrastructure. Well, I, I think uh, it's of course a very good question, but I think a a fulsome answer to that would way ex way exceed the amount of time we have allotted. Um, so I, I want to be sensitive to your your time constraints here. Certainly, uh, all critical infrastructure increasingly uh, is dependent on. Um, uh, internet connectivity uh, and increasingly online and so that to the extent that a company uh, doesn't have strong cybersecurity we are more and more dependent uh, on their cybersecurity for our physical security and I think that's one of the things that the recent ransomware attacks demonstrate 
is that it's not just affecting those companies, but it can affect the average American at the gas pump or when they're buying a hamburger. And so, Director Ray, do you think um, that Congress should take actions to have mandatory cybersecurity standards for private folks doing critical infrastructure? Well, I, again, as I've said in response to other topics, I want to be careful about uh, proposing or weighing in on specific legislation, but I will say that I do believe that the private sector uh, piece of our cybersecurity as a nation uh, is absolutely indispensable. And until we figure out a way to ensure that the private sector has adequate cybersecurity and maybe just as importantly, a key part of cybersecurity uh, is closely lashed up and informing, informing the federal government, uh, the FBI, CISA, et cetera, uh, we're gonna have a problem adequately defending the country. And so I think anything that, that kind of goes at those issues is something worth taking a close look at. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, on the use of force issue, I want to quickly follow up on that issue, especially since Representative Dean didn't get a chance to ask her question. And I want to talk about the FBI's uh, collection of use of force data. I've worked on this issue in North Carolina with full cooperation from law enforcement on um, traffic statistics and um, who gets stopped and who gets searched. And um, we have a pretty model legislation um, in North Carolina for doing that. But given the possibility that at the FBI National Use of Force Data Collection Program may be um, discontinued as early as December of 2022, what other options are there for collecting law enforcement use of force data um, and what have you considered and how long would it take to establish an alternative? Well, I could, I'd be happy to have my staff follow up with more detailed information. What I would say is that we're working very hard to, uh, to increase the reporting um, and we've been of national use of force data because we believe strongly that um, only through that are we going to be able to have a thoughtful, informed conversation that's actually based on the hard facts. And I think we've made good progress. I think we recently now crossed the threshold of about 40% of sworn, I think that's about right, 40% of sworn federal, state, and local law enforcement officers across the country. And we're driving hard to try to get that number high enough so that we can start sharing the results of that uh, collection more broadly. So it was a big, big milestone. One of, the, uh, one of the milestones we crossed recently allowed us to take certain steps and we're hoping to cross the future milestones uh, before too long. But anything that you can do uh, to encourage the uh, law enforcement community, you, not just you personally, but members of Congress can use to encourage state and local law enforcement in their uh, communities to provide that data, I would certainly be appreciated. Well, uh, I will certainly do that in North Carolina. Um, do you have any um, estimated time for when you might be able to provide some information when you have a, a critical amount of that? Gentlelady's time has expired. The, uh, the witness may answer the question. Uh, let me have somebody follow up with you about where we are on time estimates. They, uh, I'm not sure if I've got the latest on that. Thank you, Mr. Director, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back, Ms. Bush. St. Louis, and I thank you, Chairman, for convening this hearing today. Director Ray, thank you for being here as well. Um, thank you for being here with us, taking this time. So as an activist and as an organizer from the front lines of the Ferguson movement, I am intimately aware of the tactics the Bureau has used when surveilling and investigating and intimidating activists like myself uh, from the height of the civil rights movement to Ferguson in 2014 to today. We now know that the Bureau did in fact investigate and surveil those protesting for racial justice and against police brutality. In anticipation of this hearing, I wrote to you on June 4th requesting access to all the information that the Bureau may have gathered about me since 2014, the Ferguson uprising and up to now. When can I expect to hear back from the Bureau regarding that information? Congressman, I, I was just recently told that you had sent uh, such a letter asking for information. As you know, we received thousands of requests for uh, files, as it were, 
uh, and there's a process for that. Uh, and I would be happy to have my staff follow up with yours to uh, help you understand how the process works, and that can give you a little bit better sense about timing and other uh, steps mm -hmm. that have to be uh, gone through. Okay. Uh, as you probably can determine from the way I've answered a lot of questions today, uh, I am very much a process guy. Ooh, uh, that's and fine. I want to make sure we follow the process here. Sure. Is it in the next seven days? Is it possible that we can get get this resolved? Um, possibly. I mean, we can go through the steps. I just want to. I'll have somebody follow up okay. with you about the we right follow process. Up. Okay. Thank you. Um, but I ask because I'm concerned about the FBI's treatment of protesters. I want to walk through the FBI's response to the white supremacist insurrection on the Capitol and the FBI's response to mass protests that swept through the country last year seeking justice for George Floyd and for Breonna Taylor. Isn't it true that the department deputized and deployed thousands of federal law enforcement, including FBI personnel, in quote, response to the events related to civil unrest, in quote, during the summer of 2020? Yes or no is fine. Well, I'm not sure I have a yes or no answer to that. Uh, I don't know that the FBI, I don't recall the FBI being deputized for things. The FBI uh, fulfilled our mission, um, some of which I've described earlier in response to one of your colleagues' questions. Uh, but whether other agencies were deputized by the mm. Justice Department would be a question better referred to the Justice Department. Okay. All right. um, I think that the answer um, that we're looking for is Yes, we have um, this information. Um, we have evidence. Um, we have evidence that the records that identify SWAT resources and special agent bomb techs um, that they were deployed. That's what's in my hand. Um, what about was the FBI authorized to use force in response to the January 6 white supremacist insurrection on the Capitol? Just a yes or a no. Was the was the FBI authorized to use force in response to the white supremacist attack on, Jan on January the 6th? Well, I think the, I'm not aware of a specific authorization to use force. I think the FBI has policies about its use of force, uh, and those policies would have been in effect on January 6th. Thank you. So you stated earlier that the Bureau does not surveil First Amendment protests, but Director Ray, isn't it true that the FBI did deploy some 120 surveillance aircrafts? I know uh, it was alluded to earlier to monitor justice for George Floyd protests.